Okay, go ahead. Good evening. It is October 16th, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law has been extended, allowing us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically in the room. However, I want to call to your attention that there are nine of us in the room at this time. Um, at the same time, we provide um, public access. Uh, this meeting is accessible in real time by, by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Am Amherst Media Channel 9 and live streamed. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the October 16, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6.32. Um, I will call upon each councilor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Shalini Ball Milne has informed me she will be absent this evening. Patty Angelis. We're not hearing you, Pat. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank uh, you. I'm present. Thank you. Great. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Whoops. Here. Thank you. Uh, Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Kathy, did you answer? Yes. I sit here. Thank you. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. See Alicia on the screen. Here. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can. Okay. It was Thank you. Faint I initially. Thank you. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please click the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise, we'll decide what to do at that point and whether or not we have to pause the meeting. Um, there is a There are some changes to the order of the agenda after completing items one through six. And I'll repeat what those items are in a moment. We will then move to item eight, a, the final report of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. That item will include a presentation, a special public comment period, and council discussion and motions. After completion of the action items, we will return to item 7A, a discussion of the CREST program with the town manager. And then we will proceed with the rest of the agenda. So items one through six, just to make sure the public is aware, are first of all, calling the meeting to order. Number two is announcements. Number three is a hearing, which we don't have tonight. Four is general public comment, but we will ask those that want to make special public comment about the AHRA report and the work of the committee that they do so when we have that special public comment. Uh, item five is the consent agenda and six is resolutions and proclamations. Are there any questions regarding the order of the agenda? I just want to note that in the audience in the town room, we have eight people. And on Zoom, we have 20. Um, so on the screen, we'll show the announcements. The next time the town council meets is November 16th, 13th, and then again on November 20th. We have various upcoming council meetings, however, that are posted on the agenda and on the screen. As I mentioned earlier, we have no public, no hearing, so we will move to general public comment. If you are in the room and you wanna make general public comment, not about the AHRA report, please make sure you have signed in. Okay. 
Second of all, if you're in the audience and you would like to make general public comment, not about the AHRA report, please raise your hand at this time. And I just wanna mention, we, we will have one general public comment period and one specific co public comment period. Okay. Um, if you are physically in the audience and you've signed in, we'll be calling on you in a moment. And Athena, how many of those, how many people have signed in? Five, okay. Uh, and I'm seeing no um, raised hands in the audience. And so we will proceed with five people on public comment. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes at the and based on the number of people who wish to speak. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter during public general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the council. Uh, so, Athena, would you please tell me the first name? Amy Zuckerman, please come up to the mic. State your name and address before you begin. And okay. please note the clock up on the screen. You'll have three minutes. Okay. Uh, good evening, Amy Zuckerman. Nowadays, I've been priced out of Amherst. I live in Turner's Falls, 23 Marshall Street. And one day, I may have enough money to return home. Um, what happened is that I started to see the headlines about the issues with press and management and all these issues. And the interesting thing, I came today and I sent all of you in the council information and proposals to deal with this because I actually had dealt with the director before all this blew up. And I had actually been working on a important manual about landlords and tenants resolving disputes peaceably. And I can thank you that because of Officer Bill Laramie, who connected me to Earl Miller, then director of press, I was able to go to the Wildflyer, Wildflyer, oh gee, Wildflyer Alliance and get a little bit of money to finish this very important manual on how people cannot kill each other. And let me tell you something, all those subjects, I'm talking to Pam, Pam about it. The stuff that goes on in this town, I call it the hit parade of slumlords and scumbag tenants. And I have a lot of ugly, sad examples of what's happened. So anyway, I just want to talk about Crest briefly. Um, what I noticed working with them, you know, this was just simply as a member of the public getting advice with ideas is first of all, I 100% agree that Crest should, be, should still stay here, should be funded properly and managed properly. My, my experience was there were not enough Management. I mean, I, I mean, Earl was very kind to me, listened to me, was supportive. Uh, but then I couldn't find him. There's no way to reach him. There's no staff. And I go in person. Like a few weeks ago, I saw Officer Griffin, who's great. Uh, the idea is, I think, very important that we take the police out of the respondents, the first responders, particularly domestic violence. I started covering the Amherst Police Department as a young journalist in 1974. 49 years ago, and I know all about police departments since I covered the news for many decades in many police departments. We get a lot of good people down here. On the other hand, they're stressed. So when does an issue become criminal versus civil? An example in the winter, I had a harassing landlord who was just horrendous, he was drunk, and I called up the officer and they know me. I said, listen, can you help me? He said, well, it's not criminal yet, Amy. I said, well, when does it become criminal? When this guy kills me? So when I talk about responders, this is so urgently needed, but why young people? Why not tap this vast, amazing population to have a hotline, crisis hotline? I've been on them. A lot of people are retired. Boomers have nothing to do but help people. You have 30 seconds. So I'm here to help whatever you want. Came down from New Hampshire for three hours today to drive and say that I want to be here, save people's lives, and whatever, wherever you can use me, I am here. I'm always going to be here. I'm the ghost. Thank you, for, thank you for your public comment. Who's next? Jeffrey Gold. Okay. Michael Hutton, please come up and state your name and address before you speak. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Hutton Woodland. I live at 67 Hulst Road in South Amherst. Uh, I'm here this evening uh, as a representative from the Abortion Truth Campaign of Massachusetts, and I'm also here to encourage a yes vote on the bylaw to ensure safe access to legally protected reproductive and gender affirming health care services, action item 8C. I did speak at the first hearing, so I'm not going to repeat those comments. Just want to say once again that I really encourage a yes vote 
Um, I also want to thank at this time, especially Anna Devlin Gautier and Mandy Johanneke, the two council members who brought, who worked very hard to write this and bring it forward to the whole council. Um, a couple of things I just want to underscore, one of which is the bylaw further solidifies and extends protections that are available in the state of Massachusetts in our town of, of Amherst. And one of the things that it will do specifically is to help encourage town representatives, which might include those at the health department or at the police department, to follow the law in protecting the identity and health information of people seeking, seeking reproductive care and gender affirming care. And especially that bylaw will help them resist any pressure that may come from outside of the town to release that information. And as I think maybe many of us are aware, that pressure is coming and it's coming from outside of our state. And so I think Amherst is really potentially gonna do a great thing by setting up some protections for folks seeking this care. Um, so again, it, it's a great step for the town and I really encourage you all to give a yes vote tonight. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next person, please, Athena. Russ Vernon Jones. Okay, thank you. Good evening, <clears throat> Russ Vernon Jones, 17 Gaylord Street. When I spoke to you two weeks ago, I was concerned about the CARES program, and I appreciate that you took time to discuss it. Tonight, I'm beyond concerned. I think the CARES program is being destroyed. I'm told that most of the responders are planning to resign. I don't know all the reasons, but here's my understanding. First, they were, have never been able to do the job they were hired for because the town never worked it out for them to get 911 calls. Second, a great deal of the good work that they were doing up until the day Earl Miller was put on leave came to a halt, and they have not been supported or perhaps even allowed to continue much of it. Third, Crest has been turned or is being turned into a subsidiary of the police department. This is not what the responders signed on for. It is not what the community was promised, and it was not what you voted for. The town manager has written that working out 911 calls is complex and is being worked on. The truth is that that work began on these issues early in 2022. The town manager was alerted then that his intervention was needed to give clear directions to dispatch, to get needed legal, legal opinions, and to begin impact bar get impact bargaining started. Why that didn't happen a year and a half ago, I don't know. The current leadership team is not similar to the CRESS implementation team of 2022. It lacks the three members who had spent a year researching and studying community responder programs around the country, consulting with national experts, listening to our Aris community, including the BIPOC community, and carefully evaluating options. The current team lacks that experience and expertise. On a related but separate issue, when Mr. Miller had been on administrative leave for almost a month, I learned in a meeting with some town hall staff that he had not been given a copy of the allegations against him or fully informed, been fully informed about them, nor had he had an opportunity to tell his side of the story, present evidence, and refute allegations. That seems incredible to me, and I don't know if he's yet been given that opportunity. The details of what Mr. Miller is alleged to have done or not done are understandably personnel matters requiring confidentiality. The question of whether town employees being forced onto administrative leave are entitled to know what the complaints against them are and have an opportunity to defend themselves is a matter of policy, administration, and basic human decency and, not, and should not be avoided by being labeled a personnel issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have one more. There's uh, two hands in the in the Zoom. Do you want to take either of those, or do you want to take the person and who signed up yes. here? Yes. Let me go ahead and bring Allegra Clark in. Please come into the audience. Unmute. State your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Allegra Clark. I am a resident of District 2 in Amherst. 
And I just wanted to reiterate um, my concern around the CRESS program. I'm speaking as a member of the community tonight, not as a co-chair of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. But I am very grateful for what Mr. Vernon Jones just laid out. Um, I appreciate all the hard work he and the rest of the CSWG had done towards putting CREST together and working on the implementation team. I share the concerns that this interim leadership does not have the same structure as the implementation team and that there are neither members of the CSWG nor the CSSJC as part of the team. Um, and I do have additional concerns based on some information that was shared in the CSSJC meeting last week that as of January 2nd of 2024, Ms. Ms. Young will no longer be a member of the implementation team. Um, and I wonder if that means that there is a shift coming on January 2nd that we are unaware of, or if there's an end date in, in sight for this interim leadership team altogether. So that um, would be my question and concern regarding the interim leadership of CRESS. Um, I, again, am fully supportive of their mission as it was laid out by the CSWG. I think there was a lot of community engagement done and that should not be ignored in moving forward. I hope that we will be able to keep the program forward, moving forward, and that it will serve the purpose that it was intended to upon its creation. But I do think that that will require more participation, whether it's from CSWG or CSSJC. And I believe that there are members of both committees that would be willing to serve in whatever role is needed going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else from the town room? Devorah Jacobson. Okay, thank okay. you. And does that include the people from the room? Okay, uh, Pat, um, Pat O. <laughs> Miss Pat, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening, can people hear me? We can. Okay, Pat Ananibako from uh, District 2. I want to echo what Mr. Ross Venom Jones and Allegra just said. In addition, I'm actually not surprised be though frustrated because CRES was set up to fail. The police did not support it. The dispatcher did not support it. The fire department, our town government, most of you in this room did not support CRES because you did not fully fund CRES, okay? And secondly, our town government, our town do not support people of color in position of power. See what is happening to Mr. Miller. And then another black woman, Ms. Young is set up to do the dirty job for our town government. When we have white administrators, misbehave, you sitting there come to their rescue and defense. Last year, July 22nd, our former police chief refused to apologize. Rather, some of you had private meetings with the police officers and then re-victimized the youth that were harassed by the police. I have been pushing for a year about upper funds and also Hazel black owned business that went out of business because of your action. You approved $300,000 for Drake, white owned. They don't even need the funding. And the same, this you did not approve enough funding for the rest of business community. BBAA, existing businesses, has still not gotten 
any funding. And we still have four point something million. And when I called on the building commissioner to resign, Mr. Uh, Paul tried to silence me last month. I have news for you. I'm not afraid of anybody in this town. I will keep speaking up for injustice in our town. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We are concluding public comment. And we will go on to the consent agenda. We're going to put the consent agenda on the screen. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy to remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting. Ask that it be removed as I go through the list. The request to move an item, remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. So the motion is as follows, to move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. One, waiver, waiver of Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rule 8.6 for Agenda Item 9.A.1. Second one is 6A, adoption. Uh, uh, Lynn, I have my hand raised on that one. Okay, I will make. I will finish and then call on the people who have their hands raised, okay? Sorry. Um, adoption of resolution in the wake of the, I'm sorry, I have to adjust my screen. In the wake of the Hamas attacks on Israel. 8B, adoption of amendments to bylaw 3.48, stretch energy code. 8C, adoption of bylaw to in, ensuring safe access to legally protected, protected reproductive and gender affirming health care. And 9A1, a approval of the town manager appointment to the elementary school building committee. Pat, you have your hand up. I'd like to remove 6A, please. Okay, we will come to 6A later in the meeting. Dorothy? I do not know what the wording of that um, resolution is at this time. It has now packet. been placed in your packet. It wasn't there when I looked earlier tonight. I don't spend the whole night looking. Thank you. Andy Steinberg. I'm somewhat confused to where we are, but I was wanting to remove 6A. Okay. We will take up 6A later in the meeting after we finish the action items and the discussion item. I know that's a little unusual, but I wanna make sure that because of various groups that have joined us, we get to meet with them as well. Are there any other items that people want to remove? Is there a second to the motion? Second. Thank you. We'll move to a vote. The motion's been made in second. Shalini Abel-Milne is absent. Um, Patty Angelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Pam Rooney? I'm sorry, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It's unanimous except for one counselor being absent. As in the past, if an item has been approved on the consent agenda, there can still be comments when we get to that item on the regular agenda. Okay. We will be skipping item six and come back to both six and seven later. Action items. Um, at this point, we are going to ask the members who are in the town room that are with the AHRA committee to come up and sit at the table up here. And at the same time, those of you that are in the audience that are members of AHRA, Paula Lord, Irv Rhodes, we're going to bring you into the room. Alexis Reed. 
uh, I'm sorry, Alexa. Alexis Reed, Alexis and I believe Reed, their hand you. is up. Have I missed anybody else? I'm quickly looking. No, nope, I think that's I that's think. good. Okay, Alexis, we're bringing you in. Okay. Um, this this meeting has been posted as a meeting of the HRA, and with that, I'm going to ask the chair to call the HRA meeting to order. Welcome, calling to order the uh, October 16th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 6.56 p.m. And I will briefly make sure that members can be heard. And I will start with uh, Ms. Bridges. And yes, in order to... Hello, I am Deborah Bridges. I was happy. So right now we're just doing a sound check, but we'll, we're going to circle back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shabazz? Shabazz, present. Hala? Lord, present. Excellent. Dr. Rhodes? Er, present. Alexis and baby? <laughs> present. <laughs> Excellent. All right, wonderful. So, uh, um, Nina, if you would be able to pull the slides up for us. While we do that, great. could I just mention? Yeah, of course. So beginning this portion of the meeting by thank, I want to begin the portion of the meeting by thanking the members of the HARA for their tireless and important work that culminates with the presentation of your final report tonight. Specifically, we want to thank Councilor and Chair and Councillor Miller, who actually began chairing before she became a counselor. And we also want to thank the other members of the committee who are here with us tonight, including in the in the room, we have uh, Dr. Amakar Shabazz and Heather Halla Lord. And then in the audience on Zoom, I'm sorry, we have Deborah Bridges in the room. And in the audience, we have Heather Halla Lord. Dr. Irv Rhodes, Alexis, and her the new addition to the family. And I believe that's it. Am I correct? Yes. And we should acknowledge Yvonne Mendez, who is unable to be here. Right. Thank you. So with that, uh, we're going to go have a presentation. Then other members of the assembly who would like to make comments will have time to do that. And then uh, we'll have special public comment and then move to discussion of the council. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as we have our slides up, we'll begin the presentation and I'll be doing my best to manage. I'm, I have a script and I'm also have to hold this button down here. So if you, if you can hear me at any point, let me know. Oh, <laughs> oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have Mandy holding the button. That's going to make things easier. <laughs> Teamwork. All right, wonderful. So this is a significant night for the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, and we are grateful to the town council, town manager and staff, and to those in the public who have joined us tonight. Our final report and presentation tonight is a culmination of two years of work together as an assembly and with the community to understand what reparative justice means in Amherst. Our report and its recommendations should not be seen as an end to our reparative work as a community, rather as a roadmap for us to follow as we continue our journey. We have taken a bold step as a community to pursue this critical work, and we all have a role to play to ensure it is carried forward. While the AHRA as a body will no longer exist, we welcome your feedback and we thank you for your support. I'm going to go through some highlights from our report and then turn it over to assembly members to briefly speak about their experience serving on the committee. Athena, could you move to the next slide, please? Our report is dedicated to Dr. Demetria Shabazz, beloved wife of assembly member, Dr. Emilkar Shabazz and deeply dedicated social justice warrior 
We are grateful for her service to our community and to the world, and we will miss her very much. Next slide. And this is the group. <laughs> so uh, some of us are here tonight and some of us are on uh, Zoom as Lynn mentioned, and Yvonne is, is unable to be with us tonight. Next slide, please. There are many folks to thank um, and uh, hopefully we've listed most of them, if not all of them in this acknowledgements uh, page of the report. I do want to give special recognition to Mattia Kramer and to Elena Zakashansky for their contributions in writing and in designing the report. Next slide, please. Part one of our report focuses on anti-Black racism in Amherst, past and present. I will not spend too much time on this tonight, but I encourage you to read the two reports published by Reparations for Amherst in the appendix. By the way, the report is 161 pages with the appendix. So if that's overwhelming, <laughs> the, the report itself is only 37, it might be 38 pages now. These reports are one point of reference to understand our history and the current day disparities that persist in our community. I also encourage you to engage with the work of Ancestral Bridges and other folks who hold the key to our community's lesser known history. Next slide, please. Part two of our report focuses on reparative justice in Amherst, specifically the charge of the AHRA and the steps we took as a body to learn what the community envisioned. Our charge was to develop and recommend to the town council a municipal reparations plan that includes both a reparations fund and a community-wide process of reconciliation and repair for harms against black people. Next slide, please. A significant piece of our work was to consult with the community, which we did in a number of ways, including the development of a black census and a community survey, both with the support of the UMass Donahue Institute and a number of large and small listening sessions. Our report includes the full results of our survey and the findings from our listening sessions. Next slide, please. Part three of our report, and the place I'd like to spend a little more time tonight, concerns the funding plan. You can see in this slide I've highlighted two items, both of which the town council will have the opportunity to discuss and vote on tonight. Please note the votes will be motions to refer to the Finance Committee in the case of the fund and to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee in the case of the successor body. So I'll begin by talking about uh, the recommendation to accelerate the development of the fund. And this recommendation generally says uh, that we recommend the town council approve operationalizing a $2 million reparations endowment fund within four years. And just as a reminder, uh, when the $2 million was committed to by the town council, uh, the idea was we were going to model the annual tax uh, revenue from cannabis on an annual basis and move money from our certified free cash into the dedicated reparations fund. Um, this would, uh, at the rate when, when we made that commitment, would take about 10 years to fully develop. It's also important to recognize that we expect this fund to operate as an endowment so the principal will remain steady and an investment uh, in, in, uh, income off of that will be used to pursue initiatives. Uh, with the sort of downturn that we're expecting with cannabis tax revenue, as well as the desire both um, from the committee and from the community to begin pursuing initiatives now, we're asking that the town council consider three options for accelerating the fund. And I'll just briefly review these options because uh, this is what the council will have the opportunity to vote on tonight in terms of referring these options and, and potentially other options, but these are the options that we've identified uh, to the finance committee for review. 
So the first is to fully fund the stabilization fund at $2 million immediately by borrowing from reserves. And in this option, the town subsequently pays back the reserves through the annual flow of certified free cash. The, sec the second option is the town devotes $100,000 annually from cannabis tax revenue to fund reparative justice initiatives immediately, and any remaining cannabis tax revenue over and above $100,000 are deposited into the dedicated account. Um, it's important to note that we have determined that $100,000 annually is needed to pursue meaningful reparations initiatives. And the report really f fleshes this out a lot more. It talks about other sources of funding that are or could be available to the AHRA. So um, I, I recommend uh, digging into the report a little bit more for that. Option three is uh, to meet this $2 million commitment over the next four years by moving a quarter of the necessary funding from reserves into the reparation stabilization fund each year annually through FY 2028. And so this again will be something that the council will come back to after the presentation and public comment. The second piece that I wanted to focus on here is also going to be voted on tonight. And this will be a, a referral to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. And it's a charge for a successor body uh, for, for this work. And, and we, we really want to express um, how important we believe the successor body is. I think there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how many people, how often this body meets, those kinds of things. We certainly understand the demands on, on town staff and also in staffing these uh, committees. So, uh, but we do feel that in order to carry forward the work, a successor body is needed. Okay, next slide. Part four of our work, our, excuse me, of our report is focused on priorities and eligibility. We have concluded that youth programming, affordable housing, and business grants are the three priority areas for use of reparations funds. We expect the successor body, if formed, will focus on these three priorities as they begin their work. Next slide, please. Our recommendations embrace the broadest notion of eligibility. Even as this report regards all African heritage residents of Amherst as eligible for reparations, it is important to distinguish between these three groups as the differences between them will become important to any successor committee charged with evaluating applications or selecting specific reparative justice initiatives. And the three uh, groups here are, are listed on this slide. Next slide, please. Part five of our of our report focuses on uh, truth and reconciliation initiatives um, that we hope the town and other community members and organizations will pursue. Um, this is a list of them here, and um, we want to recognize the uh, the important work that the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department has already begun. We also want to recognize the important work that other organizations in our community have begun um, long before we started our work. So uh, we hope that the, the town will, um, with in partnership with community, pursue these initiatives. Next slide, please. Sorry, Athena, next slide, please. Is there not a next slide? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> okay, you know what? You're right. There's not a next slide. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so we do have some additional recommendations that were to um, the superintendent of schools, to, to Amherst College, as well as to the University of Massachusetts. I did not create a slide because we will not be talking about those in any detail tonight. Um, and then I did not create a slide for the appendix, uh, although I, I recommend that folks uh, do um, 
take a look at what's in the appendix. There's some really interesting information there. Um, we have some uh, legal opinions from KP Law that are very interesting. There's a draft legislation um, for special legislation if we are to pursue that um, and uh, the results of our various surveys and um, other reports. So thank you, Mandy. Take it from here, yeah. Um, so I am now going to turn it over to any members of the assembly who would like to speak um, and speak to the town council about their experience, to the public about their experience, um, or anything else they would like to uh, have heard. And so if you would like to do that, I'm looking at you. We're, we're going <laughs> to we'll go take to councilor comments later. Okay. Yes. Right. That's, yes. That's how we're okay. This was, this is a time for the assembly members to make comment. Perfect. Okay. Right. So I'm going to start with Ms. Bridges. <laughs> Hello. I am Deborah Bridges. I was, I was happy to accept the invitation to join the AHRA committee after realizing that generations of Black Amherst residents were not included in the first report. Coming from these first generations of Black families, it was imperative to me that the roots of Black history in Amherst be acknowledged. So I'm happy to be on this committee with people who have Amherst's best interests of equity at heart and to be a part of this final to uh, 2023 final report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. And I know you have another, and we'll get to that when, how about we'll do that during the public comment. I'll just quickly explain to Lynn. Okay. All right, Dr. Shabazz. Well, it's um, been a uh, wonderful journey with all of uh, uh, my colleagues on the um, AHRA and um, the yesterday I was at a common read of a book called Repentance and Repair. And the this was over at the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, good group of people reading this work, a lot of it predicated on a 12th century Jewish uh, theologian, scholar, Mama, uh, Rabbi Rambam, I think they call him, <laughs> Rabbi Mamanides. Anyway, um, it's so wonderful to see members of the town, uh, congregations like that, like the Jewish congregation of Amherst, like students on our, on our three uh, campuses, um, uh, college and university campuses in our in our high schools um, all across the town really beginning to engage in real study of these issues reading our report getting feedback from folks um, this is really everything I I personally hoped would would come about we may not see all of the ramifications and all of the magnitude of this report and of this work that the town is engaged in uh, right now in our minds. We may not see it even this year or next year. And However you act on the, the question of the endowed fund and how quickly it comes about, there's a real long-term matter here. It's how this plays out for Alicia Walker's great great grandchildren. It's how this plays out seven generations from now, how they look back on what we're doing here in 2023. That's where my mind goes towards. That's where Demetria Shabazz guides me to think about it seven generations from now. What is the impact of what we're doing tonight? So, with that, I just say again, Thank you to the council and thank you to my colleagues on the assembly. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. 
Um, I'm going to go uh, to Alexis. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, well, so first I want to say thank you to my colleagues as well. Um, I felt very honored to um, be made to feel like I even belong on the assembly. So thank you very much for accepting me. Um, and I've also been honored to be able to help with something that has the potential to do so much good for um, our people in Amherst. So um, I'm gonna keep it short, but thank you very much um, to my colleagues as well as um, to the council for giving this thing a shot. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. And how about Hala? Yes, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to definitely say thank you to all my colleagues. I love you dearly. Um, I appreciate the people in the town and the different colleges that have reached out to help be a part of this really historic, I would say long overdue, but let me not like bash us. We're here now, we're doing it, um, collecting the data, things that we in our living rooms talk about or in the aisles of Stop and Shop or at church in the Black community, the harms that happen every day that might not, that aren't noticed by people that don't experience it. So I'm grateful that this report will bring some of that to light. Um, I still feel a, a strong sense of urgency. There's a lot of harm being happening being happening. Love my language skills. Um, in the past couple of months, I've lost a few friends and um, three black women, black, two black, one brown. I definitely attribute the medical industrial complex for part of being complicit in their deaths. Not black women, we're not believed about our pain. We're not given treatment or seriousness stuff that could either early diagnose and prevent certain things or prevent immediate death. So um, I just want to tell all of us that there is a sense of urgency still in this work, in believing Black people's stories when we interact with the police or with the, the clerk, or not the town clerk, you're amazing, but like a clerk at a store, I can't remember the name of it, what you call it, but I just, um, I, I, I not plead, but I really pray, open my heart that this will continue to grow into action that heals harm and that prevents future harm. And um, I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Hala. Dr. Rhodes. Good evening. This, uh, I really have appreciated being on this committee. Uh, the journey uh, has been a, a really great journey. And as any journey, it has a beginning and an end. This particular ending is somewhat bittersweet uh, because we are leaving into the hands of people who uh, we don't know who will be there to carry on our work. My hope is that the council will see the benefit of our work, give it value, and ensure that it goes on into the future. This, is not been, this is, has not been a very easy task to complete in, this, uh, uh, in terms of this, uh, this report and the work that went into it over the past two years. It is very difficult for any person, group, race to look at and identify those harms that have been done to others who were not of a majority. Is a very difficult process, a painful process, but yet those issues need to be confronted. Action taken, forgiveness given, and then moving on to a future in which everyone feels, and incl feels included and that those harms that have been done have been addressed in some equitable way. It is this particular town, one of the, I guess one of the things that has been most beneficial being on this committee has been Deborah Bridges. 
and by extension, Anika, in terms of looking at and looking back on the history of Amherst. And, and, the, and, 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 and what I'm saying, what I mean by the history of Amherst, that is the Black forgotten history of Amherst. It is extraordinary how far back this family goes and how extraordinary it is that they've brought forward their story, which is Amherst's story. And is one that we need to be able to embrace, look at, examine. It's very difficult sometimes to look in the mirror and see yourself like I, I'm looking at myself on, on here right now. Sometimes it's very difficult. But that what you see is you. And not to object to it, but to look at it and say, yes, this is me. This is the truth. And now that I have examined the truth, how do I reconcile the truth with the reality? So my hope in, my hope and my desire is that this report not be put on a shelf somewhere, gather dust, and be forgotten in a year. And I would like to see and hear a commitment from this council that that will not happen. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rhodes. And before we go to council comments, I just wanted to share my deepest appreciation uh, to all of the members. Um, this journey has been, uh, along with having my children, one of the greatest honors and privileges um, and to work with you all. I'm deeply grateful that um, that I had this opportunity and thank you for all of the work that you have done um, to, to bring us to this point. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it, I think, back over to you, Lynn, for, okay, yep. thank you. Thanks. Um, again, thank you uh, for all of the hard work. Um, we can do this in two ways. We can either go to council discussion or we can go to general public comment. Is there a wish of the council at this point? Anna? General public comment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is not general. This is special public comment. Okay. So let me just uh, again ask um, for those people who... I I'm sorry. I, I think, thank you for asking. I, I got a question. Um, yes. uh, I think that it would be wonderful if the folks who are here could speak and then if we could go to uh, counselor comments um, and then uh, of course, if they want to stay for that portion, they could and share. Right. Yeah. So we're gonna Does do, that work? We're gonna okay. do the special public comment at this time. Thank you. Um, so first of all, if you're in the room, and you would like to make special public comment, if you haven't signed up yet, please do so with Athena. Okay. And if you are in the Zoom audience and would like to make special public comment, reminding you that you can also come in by phone and that shows up on Zoom, please raise your hand. Athena, how many people do we have signed up for special public comment? Four. Okay. And we have seven people who have raised their hands that are in the Zoom audience. So uh, I'd like to start with those people who are in the room. Athena? Jeffrey Gold. You want to come up together? Okay. Jeff Jeffrey Gold and it's Devorah Jacobson. Okay. Come on up. And if you would both please say your names and where you live before you begin your comments. Thank you. 
Sure, thank you very much. Is the green light on? The green light is on. Thank you. I'm Devorah Jacobson. Um, I actually used to live in Amherst. I now live in Hadley. And uh, Jeff and I are here represent, we, we are the co-chairs of the Reparations Committee of the Jewish Community of Amherst, 742 Main Street. <clears throat> the final report of the AHRA to you, the, town, the Amherst Town Council, and thereby to each and every member of this community took my breath away. In my view, it is both an incredibly significant milestone for this town, indeed a model, in both its content and in its process for communities throughout this nation. I am in awe of its comprehensive scope, its attention to great detail, and its well-crafted writing. I am deeply inspired by its commitment to truth-telling. I applaud its focus on documenting past harms, as well as capturing, through numerous methods, contemporary and multi-generational voices that remind us that the past is not at all past. I appreciate the articulation of the three areas of funding priorities, as well as its additional recommendations for truth and reconciliation and other remedies outside the fund. Finally, and probably most importantly, I am most grateful for its focus on not only, quote, what is necessary and possible within the scope of town government, but on the choice to seize the opportunity finally in 2023 to put forward a more expansive vision. It is a vision that would invite not only municipal government to be involved, but local, public and private institutions and individuals as well. I believe this report tells each one of us quite emphatically and with so much clarity that the work of racial healing and repair of apology and restitution, when initiated locally, can help galvanize, strengthen, and push forward the national conversation to create federal reparations. And as we do it locally, as we center the experience of African Americans in telling the unique and truthful history of Amherst, we must begin to face that past. And because of it, engage in meaningful and concrete acts of repair as detailed in this comprehensive report. Only then can we transform our community into one that is more just and more humane for all of its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to give each of you three minutes. So please go ahead. My name is, my name is Jeff Gold. And uh, with Devorah, I am co-chair of the Reparations Committee of the Jewish Community of Amherst. I live on uh, Harkness Road. However, I live on the Pelham side. So if I walk across <laughs> the street, I'm in Amherst. Um, <clears throat> the presentation of the AHRA's final report to the town council should be received with deep respect and a profound sense of gratitude. This is an impressive document. It gathers both historical and current data and identifies a concrete set of strategies and goals that taken together is groundbreaking. Amherst is only the second town in the entire country to have a reparative plan. We are indebted to the AHRA and offer them a profound thanks for the work they did over the past two years on the town's behalf. The question that lies before this governing body is, how are you going to respond to this report? It is in many respects a daunting question with far-reaching consequences, seven generations. Our town is facing so many crises that the very fabric of civic engagement has been challenged. On one level, our civic engagement has suffered a polarization, which is far worse in other parts of the country. That, however, 
does little to rec rectify our own problems with listening to each other and genuinely recognizing in a non-defensive manner when harms have occurred. In particular, we have to not only listen to those who have been harmed, but decide a way forward. And that involves leadership and vision. This report identifies some of the extensive harms, both past and present, done to members of the African-American community. It also insists on informing and expanding our public memory. What is the town's responsibility here? A few years ago, the town made a commitment to end forms of structural racism throughout the town. You have now been provided with a holistic blueprint. The AHRA final report represents a path forward in acknowledging the harms done, designing and implementing strategies and programs which concretize restitution in very real, impactful terms, and making a commitment to not repeat or continue those harms. No one should think this will be easy. The report offers the town government an opportunity to implement real change towards the goal of a more genuine democracy and equity. Herein lies the question. Will you exercise the historical understanding and resultant political vision to take that risk and fully embrace the task and commit to the explicit and collaborative steps necessary for its implementation? That's the question for you to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to begin with the audience. And there are, in fact, now, what are my glasses? Excuse me, nine attendees in the audience that have had their, have their hands raised. Maura Keene, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, this is Maura Keene, and I live on Dennis Drive in Amherst. And I wanted to say that I've gone to a lot of the meetings of the AHRA over the past couple of years, and I've been so impressed with the care and consideration they've given to obtaining their data to use in the report and to think about how they were gonna deal with a lot of the sticky issues that came up. And I really hope that everybody will read this report carefully. I do wanna call attention to the part three about the funding plan because the council's plan to fund this endowment over 10 years is inadequate. I don't think the town or the country can wait 10 years to start programs to repair the injustices done. It should be started immediately. And I hope that one of these plans, I hope the immediate one of taking the $2 million out of the free cash and repaying it will be the one that's accepted. But one of the plans, I hope the finance committee will recommend and I do want to say that Amherst got a lot of great publicity for being the second uh, municipality in the country for supporting, creating a reparations program, just as we got a lot of publicity, good publicity for creating the Crest Department. That has not gone well. And I hope that we do a better job with the reparations than we have done with the Crest Program. So... I hope everybody takes this report seriously. It's really a masterpiece. Thank you for joining us, Maura. Uh, we're going to go back to the audience that's in the room. Lauren Mills, come on up and please state your name and address before your comment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lauren Mills, uh, 12 Long Meadow Drive. I did um, speak on reparations at the last town council meeting, I believe the 12th, um, but I did want to come in person today because I feel that um, our, our life experience and the things that have been going on in the town really require all of us to be part of a solution as to um, bringing equity and repair to the town. Um, I agree with um, Dr. Irv Rhodes when he says that we need to look at ourselves because when we 
see the whole picture of what is going on with um, people in the Black community, which you can um, further detail as African Americans. Um, as I said before in my, my public comment last week, um, there are other ethnic groups that make up the Black community of Amherst. And if we don't look at each other, um, we, we can't see the full picture. If African Americans and people of color don't look at themselves, they can't see what's really going on in their communities. So I just also wanted to say, I didn't have anything prepared, but um, I do come from an urban city, the urban city of Boston, and there are other reparations um, task force that I've um, followed. Um, there's one in Boston, there's one in New Jersey, there was the one in California, and this just would not fly as a reparations um, solution. Um, I know that there was a lot of work that was put into the report, but this is this way of, of, of glossing over things. Um, just would not fly in the black community. You, if we're going to speak truth to power, we have to realize that we have to let people know that there is a lot of um, injustice going on, and it's not just um, it's not it's a day to day thing. It's and, and reparations does bring up the issue of how do you pre prepare for long term, not just for the immediate. And the other thing that I would just say is that the way that the town has um, handled, the Crest Department has handled um, DEI and also cer certain comments that have been made about um, youth empowerment and, and bringing forth a youth community center. That is a direct reflection on how the, the town council feels about um, the issues that are in the, the report. And so I, I must say that I am disappointed, but I hope that um, the follow-up um, body that does continue this work will include more voices of African-Americans and people of color. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. Uh, we're going to go back to the audience on Zoom. Allegra Clark, please enter the room, state your name again, and where you live. Um, hi, Allegra Clark, still a resident of District 2. Um, I just wanted to thank the assembly members for the hard work and time that they put into the, again, community engagement that went into this report and these recommendations. Um, I, again, am speaking as a person, not as a representative of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, but I do think that there's a lot of overlap in the priorities that have been identified by the assembly and in some of the work that the CSSJC is doing to further the work of the Community Safety Working Group. Um, and so I do see a number of parallels between the process that CSWG and the assembly have gone through. And I hope that when the idea of a successor committee is referred to GOL, that it will be implemented. I think it's really important that we have a standing committee working on these issues as it has been with the CSWG turning into the CSSJC. Um, there's been a lot of hiccups in our work and I would foresee that without adequate funding and prioritization that again like Dr. Rhodes said we don't want to see just another report put up onto a shelf we want to see this living in our community um, so again thank you to all the assembly members for their hard work thank you for joining us Allegra uh, in the town room Athena I'm Okar Shabazz Please come on up. Hi, um, I'm Milkar Shabazz. Uh, I live at, uh, uh, I'm not sure which district, uh, Chapel Road in Amherst, District 5. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
I guess what I wanted to say is uh, that uh, this work is very important. Um, I don't think we can console ourselves that just because uh, this subject and the work isn't being done across America is really an indicator that, you know, this is so unique or, or should be so unique um, a, uh, a task. Um, you know, there should, there should really be more voices um, contributing to this. And uh, um, I think, uh, you know, also, um, if any place were, were for this work to get done, I think Amherst would be a great place for it. Um, I think, you know, we have a certain amount of sensitivity and, um, and I, and I hope that sensitivity is, uh, is something that we all use and, um, try to listen to every, uh, person with a story about their racial experience. Um, I, I guess I would like to say that, you know, um, every age of a black person is an expert on what it's like to live in a racial world. Um, and they're all worth listening to. Um, I think, uh, we can, we can definitely, um, can, you know, make a better document, um, or continue to do this work. Um, because, uh, not everyone has spoken yet. And, um, until, um, we really are able to, you know, have a, an environment that every story can be listened to, um, you know, there's still some work to be done. So um, I, uh, I definitely need to read this document, um, but I also feel like um, I'm already an expert in um, what the the need and the uh, the uh, the experience that I have to share, um, and I and I feel like there's other people out there that feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Emma Carr. Um, we're going to go to the audience again, and Sierra Cosby. I apologize if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, please enter the room, state your name, and where you live. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kiara Cosby, former Amherst resident. Um, I commend Amherst and the AHRA for taking steps toward, toward reparations for Black Americans, and I hope that you'll proceed with those efforts. Although it would be a great byproduct, the burden of ending racism shouldn't fall on Black American reparations, just as that of Jewish Holocaust survivors did not end anti-Semitism and that of Japanese Americans did not end anti-Asian hate. The goal of reparations should be to provide just restitution to the Black American ethnic group, not racial group, that continues to experience genocide and multi-generational harms due to the cumulative effects of slavery in the U.S. and its badges. To divert attention and already limited resources away from this unique group by including other demographics is ethnic erasure, is misappropriation, and it exacerbates harm and prior exploitation. Although the plan says that descendants of U.S. slavery are prioritized in the first two eligible cohorts, there's no proposed timeline that demonstrates when the priority window closes and when those designated of African heritage become eligible, nor is there any set aside percentage of resources designated for the formerly enslaved population. There's no clear definition of African heritage people and no objective measure to determine who falls within that third cohort. In its broadest interpretation, anyone with brown skin or a percentage of so-called African DNA could qualify. With genealogical resources and support, those in cohorts one and two will be able to document their lineal ancestors and many of the quantifiable harms those ancestors suffered. This model of eligibility is not a favorable precedent for state and federal program. Um, there is no, also no indication that citizenship would be a requirement for eligibility. One of the multi-generational harms to Black Americans for which reparations is owed has been the diversion and denial of 14th Amendment citizenship rights and government resources that were initially secured for the freedmen and freed people, while the government simultaneously created pools of resources uh, for newer arrivals that Black Americans did not have access to. Um, I hope Amherst will consider these concerns and also prioritize the work of organizations such as Ancestral Bridges moving forward in the reparative justice process. And I hope that you will move forward um, with urgency. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Kira. 
other people from the room. Okay, then we're going to go on. Ash Hartwell, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I have recently moved from Amherst to uh, South Hadley. My heart is still in Amherst <clears throat> and uh, I consider myself an extended citizen of Amherst. And I'm deeply concerned and involved with um, the issues that we've discussed today. First, a great tribute to the work of this group. Um, I think that they started the, they, they have continued, but also started work on doing the kind of research that's really going to be necessary to uh, develop a holistic approach to addressing equity and justice for the black members of our community. Um, I think although it's taken two years, it's also just the beginning. <laughs> There's so, so much work to be done. And for that reason, it is very important that the work continue, not, not have a gap, not have a two month, three months longer, but to get on with it. Um, I also think that, um, that how, whatever policy and programs and uh, verbal work is done, there also has to be done a lot of work from the heart. Um, a lot of work of changing people's relationships and their understandings and their love, frankly. And uh, for that reason, I, I, I wanted to call attention to the emphasis that the report makes on, on continuing townwide programming and truth and reconciliation of racial healing and visioning, along with the policy changes and the uh, by the way, I'm totally in agreement with Maura King on, on the need to have an, a fund that is continuing that supports this work going forward um, and, and not wait for 10 years before an endowment is large enough to do it. It, it really is important, that financing. Um, the the uh, need for townwide programming uh, really is essential to deepen the knowledge, understanding, and acknowledgement of the deep racial harm inflicted by long and great systems and relationships, as has been noted. That is an understanding that can only come with study and learning and knowledge. Um, and, and lots of folks in the town don't get, get it yet. And it's important that you get it. In fact, I, I, I would actually advocate that the, the town council might really consider doing the stolen beam as one way into this. But uh, I, I think it's really important that that be recognized as an essential part of, of going forward. I also agree with Amakar Shabazz, this is a long-term project. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, as um, Barbara Love once said very beautifully that the socialization process in society works to ensure that each person learns what they need to know to behave in ways that contribute to the maintenance and perpetuating of the existing system, independent of their belief in its fairness or efficacy. That's a very important statement because it suggests the need to um, address that in our learning process. Thank you. I'm sorry I went over time. <laughs> Ash, Ash, thank you for joining us. And um, we're going to go on to Antonia Edwards. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Antonia Edwards. I'm with Solidarity Community Engagement Group. I am in the city of Boston. However, I have had friends and um, family who have attended UMass Amherst and also lived there. I've also participated in many of the um, Zoom calls um, for the initial planning. I'm just going to say that this was an extensive report that was done in a record time. We have task force have taken over two years, like the California task force, to have an interim report and then a final report. I don't feel as though this... Um, report that does any justice, especially to our ancestors. I find it very disrespectful. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Nowhere in the report does it mention our ancestors as being the American freedmen, which are the four million formerly emancipated slaves. There's no other reparation package, whether it be the Jewish Holocaust, Japanese, or any other part that don't mention the original harm party. I think it's egregious. I think it's very disrespectful. It just talks about black enslavement, or African slaves, and I also see the eligibility references on um, Black, Indigenous, or BIPOC. You can't have reparations without addressing or even paying homage to the original harm parties. We have a lot of family members who have migrated 
to the Great Migration up north to, to, to run from racial terror. They ended up in North only to face racial, racial terror. So, and so these people that are migrated are the American freemen. So to have a report about reparations and not mention them is totally disrespectful and it's never been done in any other reparation package. If you plan to go forward with this out of respect for our ancestors, please at least reference them. And that's what I like to see in this report. I can't have you change the report, your mindset or whatever, but please at least respect my ancestors or our ancestors. We're not BIPOC, we weren't BIPOC in 1865. Indigenous has absolutely nothing to do with the formerly emancipated slaves. Stop merging all these other groups into our ancestralism and stop disrespecting us. We wouldn't do that with the Jewish Holocaust. We wouldn't do that with the Japanese. We are very distinct and specific group of people. We're American freedmen. We have the American Freedmen Act of 1865. It emancipated us. We are American freedmen. We're not African-American. We're not black. We're not BIPOC. We are American freedmen. And I'd like to see that somewhere in the document referenced somewhere. There would never be a reparations package that didn't include the initial harm party. And I'd like to see that. I've asked this four times. And, I, and even if you don't reference it throughout your document, pay homage to our ancestors at least. Be respectful. So it is a good report. It's very long. It doesn't satisfy me. But again, the only thing I have a bone to pick with is the fact that you don't even pay respect to my ancestors. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Pat, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening again. Pat Ananibako from District 2. My heart is full of joy tonight. I want to first thank the ARHA uh, that did excellent work. I have read the, the, the document. I'm so appreciative. appreciative of you all, and also to the town council. Thank you so much. I have respect for you for allowing the committee to exist and to do this report tonight. Um, one thing that has not been mentioned tonight is as an African immigrant in Amherst, when this group was formed, I was really, um happy that the group meaning ARHA was inclusive as we all know black people we are also diverse group and so i really really liked the report the group actually did extensive outreach to the black community several times there was a separate group that men that met uh, that was that was meeting as well, and so um, I appreciate the hard work of the group and the team. You know, I know it wasn't easy to put to put out, but for my gr great great grandkids in the future, for them to read that their family was also included in this report as an African Nigerian, actually. We also suffered from slavery. Our people, the best of, of the best, were taken away from us. It's a huge loss in, in, in African continent. So we should remember that when we talk about reparation. Any black person on the planet was impacted by slavery. And I thank ARHA. You made history. I'm so proud to be experiencing this tonight. Thank you so much. And I want to urge you, the town council, don't put it in the shelf. Do something, act on it. Let's not have Chris situation repeat itself. Fully fund everything. Take all the recommendations. And I challenge you to act like Councillor Michelle. Go out of your comfort zone for the first time and do the right thing. Yes, you may lose some friends. Don't worry about the election. Do the right thing. This is a huge opportunity for you to have, you know, to make history. Help the powerless in our town. This is your time. 
you have the power to, to approve everything. And please try to support a uh, successor group. That has to happen to make sure everything is implemented. I went out of my uh, time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. Um, Mary Pacino, Porcino. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Mary Porcino. I'm from uh, District 1, Pulpit Hill Road, um, uh, specifically from uh, the social justice circle of the Cherry Hill co-housing community. Um, and I have, uh, as a white resident of Amherst, um, participated um, behind the scenes and in the work of uh, AHRA um, and specifically uh, have been uh, independently uh, working on educating other white residents uh, in the history of racism in, in our country. Um, and I followed very closely the work of AHRA in this past year. And just briefly, I wanna say that I am pleased um, with their work um, and with the report, I, I, I'm, I like its scope and the, its concrete uh, recommendations and its vision. And I'm very much looking forward to participating with uh, my Amherst neighbors in making their, uh, their recommendations uh, actually come to life in our town. Uh, we have a lot of work yet to do and I'm excited to be a part of that. And I just like to say that uh, on this day, I'm proud to be an Amherst resident. Um, and, and I'm proud for the genuine efforts that I feel like our town is making to address local racism and to put into effect repair and reparations. So, so thank you everyone for your work. Mary, thank you for joining us. Uh, Diana. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You need to unmute, please. There you go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm Diana Stein. I'm from District 4 in Amherst. I want to thank the AHRA for the excellent report. I participated in the Stolen Beam series, and it led me to appreciate this report. Specifically, it's uh, the fact that it deals specifically with recommendations. I, I like the concreteness very much. I hope that the council will follow um, these key suggestions specifically. Um, I think there needs to be a follow-up committee uh, to carry on the work. And I think we need to have a specific financial mechanism so that it's a committee with teeth. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for joining us, Diana. Anita Sorrow, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Anita Sorrow, I'm in District 5. Um, while it may not be perfect and uh, to uh, some people's eyes, to mine, the final report of AHRA is exceptionally well-reasoned, thoughtful, and informative. Every historical and contemporary fact it reports is important and verifiable. And I believe that every recommendation is achievable if there is the will to do them. Acting on these recommendations does not require town council to ignore other priorities you have set. It does not propose a zero sum, but it brings another important lens from which you can consider all of the actions that you take, you take as you go forward. It provides a roadway towards ensuring that those who have been and continue to be harmed by the legacy of slavery are treated equitably. We want Amherst to be a healthy, thriving community, 
but that requires that all of its residents are able to live their lives fully. It means that all aspects of community living are accessible to all. This report provides remedies that can bring the lived experience of people of African heritage into alignment with those of us who benefit from white privilege. And it will improve the lives of all of us who live in Amherst, regardless of ethnic or racial origin. Please do not let this report get buried or ignored after tonight. I implore you to read it carefully, to consider and fully appreciate all that it teaches, and most importantly, to act upon each of its recommendations. In the words written in Brown v. Board of Education too many years ago, to act on them with all deliberate speed. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Anita. That concludes Lynn, the special. There's there's one more comment. Uh, Deborah Bridges had a comment oh. that she wanted to read. All right. Thank you, Deborah. I have a comment from Dr. Carly Tartikoff. She has a statement. And the African Heritage Reparation Assembly is offering us a priceless gift. As a black woman, a retired public school teacher, a university professor, and resident of Amherst since 1968, I applaud you for using your beautiful minds and hearts to help us acknowledge, heal, and thrive as we continue to move forward in our search for equity and truth. And that is from Carly Tartikoff. Thank you. And okay. Uh, that concludes our public comment. We're going to now go to council discussion. And in the council discussion, I just want to make note, there are two motions on the motion sheet. The one is the referral with regard to the funding to the finance committee. And the second is the referral to GOL with regard to a successor committee. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm looking for councilor comments or discussion. Dorothy. And just very briefly, I support the report. And I don't like what happens at, after many things get referred to the finance committee. They get cut down, reduced, and sometimes they die. Um, I think there's always going to be something else that we should do with our money. That's just the way it is. But I'm I'm still very I'm 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 very upset about Cress and this is that is influencing some of my feelings. All right, we do something, people get together, they get very smart, they write something wonderful, a great report, we get attention and and we get publicity, and then the thing dies. Uh, I just don't want to see that. Um, that's how you kill hope in people. So th there are asks in here. There are financial asks. Um, that most people who presented them makes it sound rather reasonable that we should speed up the funding. And that means that money will have to be spent. And I think we should not just say, oh, we love it, we love it, and then pass it off to finance and let finance decide we can't afford to do it. And then we've all done we've done our bit. I, I, I just don't like that anymore. Um, my hand was raised originally in that I wanted Michelle to include the shortened slide packet um, so that we could get that too. Uh, I love your report, but it's very long, okay? They will, it, it will be added to the um, packet. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's what I have to say, that I, I think that we should put this into action and knowing that it will hurt. It will hurt to do so. It, it, if it, it has to hurt. If it doesn't hurt, then we're not doing, we're not doing it. That's it. Are there other comments from counselors? Andy. Yeah, I'll uh, try and be quick. So, but uh, first of all, I want to thank the AHRA, individual members, and as a collective group, uh, we gave you quite an assignment when we created the charge for your committee, and uh, it was one that uh, it was it was hard to know how it would come out. I think you really grabbed hold of it. You decided what it meant and you uh, developed a report accordingly. And so uh, we all owe you a lot of gratitude for your hard work and thank you. Um, I, 
just have a couple things. One is um, in response to the prior comment from another counselor, I just want to re remind everybody that the Finance Committee does not make decisions. The Finance Committee studies issues as to all of our committees and may make recommendations, but the decisions belong to the council. And um, so that at no time um, is a decision made by the Finance Committee to do anything, um, it is uh, up to the, uh, the body as a whole. And um, so we will, uh, if preferred, uh, do that, which um, do, do what is required, which is to study the request and um, comment on the consequences possibly. I can't speak for the committee, so I don't know, but the decision ultimately belongs to the council, not the committee. Uh, and the uh, one thing about the referral to the committee is that um, you referred the funding, um, it, it's a funding plan, but the specific referral is the recommendation to oper operationalize a $2, $2 million uh, reparations endowment fund within four years. Um, and we certainly will be looking at that and do so expeditiously uh, as possible. The, um, but there are other uh, recommendations that have financial consequences. And I was uh, wondering why they were not referred for comment to the committee, because I don't really feel like I wanna um, comment on them tonight, uh, but the whole questions about what the rules are for Community Preservation Act and CDBG funding are complex issues involving law and um, uh, process that um, limits actually what the council can do. And um, I think that uh, that um, really needs some more comment than I have time to give tonight, but um, it could be uh, by, uh, solved by trying to just broaden a little bit what the referral is to the finance committee. Uh, the last thing that I- Andy, time's up almost. Okay, there is one other issue and I might raise my hand again. It's on an entirely different topic. Thank you. Anika? Okay, first I want to thank all of you. Uh, Michelle, I think we first met having a conversation about this where um, I told you about um, my ancestors who were enslaved here and came here from other plantations and, you know, how growing up that had been something that I at times had been made fun of and you really committed to bringing forward the strength and what they had to endure for me to even be here talking today. So um, I thank you for that and for also calling attention to cultural appropriation. Um, I have specific questions really for all of you um, that has to do with housing. You really called out a local, national, um, historic and current issue with housing. Um, and I remember another time, you know, we talked and when we first talked, I told you about Blue Hills Road, um, you know, how we had, we had been the first families to live below Blue Hills Road. Um, and, and basically everywhere that was bordered and redlined for us to live. And, and um, many have just learned and just seen and are amazed by the deeds that were shown um, at Blue Hills basically, which banned um, black people, Jewish people, poor people um, from living in the neighborhood. I'm a downtown baby of Amity Street before Amity Place. And so I've seen um, you know, the neighborhood change and how it is, it's not affordable. Um, and so, I know that these this was brought up in the report, but I was wondering if any of you had any um, specific ideas or recommendations in terms of how housing practices to ensure that we are not continuing this disgrace and discrimination going forward. Um, and today, I think that um, that was it. I did also just want to give a, a, a separate shout out which was also brought up here to Dr. Kama Ennis, who was, I believe, as we speak, showing her film, which really, uh, Faces of Medicine, which calls attention to uh, inequities in um, healthcare. 
for people of color. And I know that that's on your agenda. Uh, that That is part of the report as well. So I think that is that is my comment of thanks and question. And I may have another. Okay. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a couple, but I'm going to start with um, one in particular. It's been mentioned by a couple of commenters. Um, and that's the eligibility criteria. Um, in the Black Reparations Project book that you referenced in your report um, and, and that has been available, I, I read that and it was enlightening. Um, Garrity in that book clearly stated that reparations should be restricted to those who have self-identified as Black for at least 12 years and who have ancestors who were enslaved in the United States. Now they're talking about national reparations, but um, we, we can take some learning from that. Evanston's program restricted their eligibility um, to black persons who lived in Evanston between 1919 to 1969 or were a descendant of such a person and that the family must have also been a victim of discrimination in housing because of policies or practices in the city at that time. But in reading your report, I see no restrictions on any eligibility. Um, all Black residents, whether they've had ancestors who were enslaved or not, whether they already live in Amherst or in fact move to Amherst five years from now, appear to be eligible. Um, so can you please help me understand how that lack of criteria and lack of definition of the range of history that is subject to the reparations program um, repairs harm done to residents of Amherst in the past because of Amherst's history with enslavement, exclusion from hotels, restaurants, barbershops, housing deed covenants, and things like that. Michelle, did you want to address that? Do you, I was just going to ask you, do you want us to address because Anika also had a question, so I, I just want to make sure. sure we're consistent. Why don't we take both of those questions? Try to the address, moment, okay, and then move on, okay. And also, I will happily turn it over to any one of my colleagues who would like to answer the question. Um, Ms. Bridges, Dr. Spaz, anyone on Zoom? Thank you. I can, um come back to the one from Councillor Lopes in a moment, but on the one around the eligibility, it's certainly one we wrestled with quite a bit and the um, and opted for an inclusive model rather than um, a, a more restrictive guidance. Um, in the inclusive model, we recognize the American freedman, as it were, um, as, a, as, as at the center of concern of a, of a black reparatory justice project. Um, we simply do not exclude, however, for in terms of the guidance we would give the successor body and the council going forward, we do not exclude uh, it purely to that. We think that the kind of criterion that's talked about of identifying and being able, having to prove your, that you identified as black for 12 years uh, from the start of the reparations program, uh, that you are um, uh, also, you know, have ancestry, an ancestor who was enslaved. We feel that is those criteria are, uh, are very much um, you know, relevant to the debate around a federal um, uh, direct cash uh, kind of payout to uh, on the basis of, of reparations for slavery. We think that is a, entirely appropriate at that level. At our town level, looking at the black census, looking at the analysis that we made of who the black population is here. Um, if we get too restrictive, then um, we, we feel we won't have, we, we won't be touching the question of structural racism as it exists in this town and how do we address it um, you know, throughout. So uh, we would just say for the successor body around specific initiatives that might come in a given year, if you have one that's addressing a very discrete issue of harm that happened in Amherst to a specific group and the eligibility criterion would, um, you know, it meets those kinds of eligibility criteria. Maybe that would be stronger in that year 
that initiative for funding over one that might address um, black students who have just arrived and um, uh, are, are reporting a certain harm. Maybe you'd get to the black student one the next year, but we don't, but we simply felt that it's not for us to provide a guidance that says right at this moment, only consider these issues and don't consider any others. Okay. Um, anything else on that one? I would just add that I think it's a great question and I'm really glad that it's been brought up. I, I think um, when we talk about direct benefits, which will only occur really through the special legislation process versus the pro more programmatic um, initiatives that we've recommended, that may also change the balance on that. And if I'm speaking out of turn, please let me know. But that's my sense of, of that as well. Um, and I wanted to also answer um, Anika's question um, to the best of my ability. So I think the question was uh, whether there were specific recommendations about housing and sort of how to solve that. Um, you know, <laughs> um, I think we know that the housing problem is deep and real and it's impacting people significantly all over the country and I think that a number of us are working on issues in the town um, both as counselors and also within the community um, to address the housing issue so my hope would be that if a successor body is formed that that body would be able to link arms with both town folks and organizational folks within town um, to continue to try to solve those problems. Does that answer a bit? Yes. Uh, yes, so I was, uh, yes, it does. And I was wondering your thoughts just also as a counselor person, like your views and housing practices also through the, through the council. Um, and it, it really, I was, um, that has, I've been thinking a lot about that from Blue Hills. Like Blue Hills and Amity was my bus stop as a kid, you know, and I grew up knowing the realities of those bands, you know, and, you know, just looking, we've got, well, she's gone, but baby Kimmy was on the screen, you know, um, we've got eyes watching. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to take a quick minute to thank all of the AHRA for their incredible work and dedication um, and for this really comprehensive report that I believe will or has the potential to support generations of residents in Amherst. And so I'm really excited um, to be a council member at this time and to have this proposal come um, in front of us as something that I can personally support. And so I'm really thankful and excited for this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I just, I also wanted to appreciate Mandy Joe's question because it is a really complex situation. And so I did also want to thank the HRA for leaving out um, that specific criteria because I do know that determining eligibility is quite complicated. Um, and given, you know, the circumstances and the lack of documentation, and the burden of proof, uh, which doesn't always exist, I think it's incredibly important that we're starting off this way. Um, and I, I also do, you know, think that that speaks volumes to the importance and really how incredible it is to have, you know, the Civil War tablets and to have those things that do exist to be here and to be referenced. I really think that this is an incredible culmination of all of the things happening. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you all and that I'm excited to be supporting sending this to the Finance Committee and to GOL for further recommendation. And I would also support the implementation of a successor committee to see this through. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, Anna? Okay. Um, ditto, all the thanks. I think this is a, a, a really comprehensive report. I learned a lot and I always appreciate learning a lot. Um, I have a couple questions and, and I want to note something that when I'm asking these questions, I think often we forget that the things that go unsaid are often the things that we like and appreciate. So I want to create a blanket of, of 
appreciation for the work that has been done and the report itself and name that my questions are not at all minimizing that appreciation. Um, and the fact that I think that there's a lot, so much in here that I'm really excited about getting going on. Uh, and I, you know, I think that there are some things that I know you're seeking the successor body, but I was like, why can't we just move right now to refer the policy on renaming streets to TSO like that? Like we could do that today, you know? Um, sorry, Anika, I know that we've got a plan for TSO for the rest of the time, but still, um, you know, so I think that there are a lot of things that I'm, I'm very excited to do. I have a couple quick questions if it's okay. So the first question is about the, the timing of the opera operationalization um, of the of the two million fund. So, you know, when we first were presented with this idea, I think a lot of folks were uh we I think a, one of the things that I'm remembering we talked about a lot was the fact that we would vote on it every year. And that if other things came up in the town that were dire needs, if the economy tanked again, if something else, like if there were a need for that funding, that it's it was a possibility that the council wouldn't vote the full amount in any in a given year. Um, and so I think one of the things that, am I correct in that that would essentially eliminate that that choice from the council each year, um, in in doing that initial plan. And then the question, my other question is, is the estimate of that payback time 10 years, just kind of flipping it. Um, I think that's, that's my first question. And then if I can lump the second one in, if that's okay, because I know you're noting it. So I appreciate it. So when I look at option three, I think Andy referenced this. Um, are you seeking to, uh, seeking to put in enabling legislation or uh, seek to petition the state to change CPA and CDBG funding? Because as of right now, that's not something the town controls those, like we don't set those percentage limits. And so I think I was wondering if there was an anticipated pre-step in that of trying to ask them to change the law so that we could even do what you're asking. Um, so those are, they're, they're kind of wedded in because they're the first two. Um, I have 20 seconds, I'm gonna keep going. So the other question was if you, I'm really excited about number nine. Um, the, I know there's tons of number nines and I just wrote excited about number nine. So I'm, I apologize, but I'm excited about it. And um, I'm curious if you have a thought on how to best advocate along other municipalities. To, uh, is that the work of the successor body? Is that something you want the council to to support and, and in what way? Um, and then lastly, it's a very specific question. Are there specific ways that you see the town supporting the tablets? You had talked, you had referenced that you wanted to see those supported. And I was curious as to how, I'm sorry, I thought I could do it in 24 seconds and I needed 30. Okay. I think I got you. <laughs> did you, did you uh, write all those down? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to. Oh. Fast oh, yes. I was typing fast. Right. Um, let me start with the tablets. Uh, so I'm going to go backwards from my list. Um, I, the tablets, thank you to Ms. Bridges to my right. Um, that is uh, something that of course I hope and we hope when we've written this report that the town will continue to support. Um, and it's something that uh, we believe that the folks who are already working on should really be guiding and leading. Okay. And so um, I'll leave that one at that. So that includes Ms. Bridges and others um, who are already working um, to really, and that doesn't mean we don't all have a role to play, we certainly do, but in terms of leading those efforts. Um, in terms of best advocating, uh, I think the question was advocating um, with like coalitions in the state. Yeah, were you yeah. envisioning basically the successor body as being a regional in, in some way, not obviously entirely regional, but in some way regional, or was that something that you expected that you would hope the council would be creating and crafting in some way. Yeah, I know yet. And that's okay too. Well, I think it's a beautiful vision. And I think that uh, it would be wonderful if our successor body was uh, working with other regional or statewide. I think there's a lot of um, interest in understanding how this works. And we as a council and as a town and our, our legal folks have done an extraordinary amount of work to understand what the possible limitations are and to understand uh, what the opportunities are. So I hope we can be a model in that respect. Um, as far as CPA and the block grant, it was, uh, I think the suggestion is um, in particular to CPA, and we met with Sean on this 
So Sean is not here to speak for himself, but what I believe I understood is that uh, CPA within the municipality creates its own guidelines. So while there are state, let me just finish what I was gonna say. So there are state guidelines, um, I believe that we need to follow, but then I believe the municipality creates their own set of goals, let's say, for how they're going to approach. Um, so I think what we're recommending here is absolutely not to change uh, any state guidelines or to pursue that necessarily, um, but rather to say, okay, you have these categories of affordable housing, historic preservation, some of these things that overlap with the work that we're doing and the initiatives that we would pursue. So let's work together to sort of leverage our funds um, and be able to pursue initiatives in partnership. As far as the block grant, it was my understanding that that is entirely in the town manager's purview to determine how the block grant would be, of course, with community input, would be um, would be awarded on an annual basis. So I would imagine that the successor body would uh, would advocate to the town manager to include some funding uh, for the reparations initiatives. And I, oh, okay, the opera, 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 <laughs> okay, I'm just not saying <laughs> of the $2 million fund. Um, so in the three options, and I, I really want to lift up what Andy said as well, that we thought about three options. We talked to some uh, staff and um, and and they aren't the only options to consider. Uh, we would hope that the the finance committee would take up the request to accelerate and then look at the three potential options and there may be others to consider. Um, and just sort of coming back to what the original vision was over 10 years is, uh, we really do feel like in order to keep the momentum and to keep this report from sitting on a shelf, we need to begin um, pursuing these initiatives uh, before 10 years. And so we would hope that with one of those options or another uh, wonderful option, we'll be able to do that within that four year time frame. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. Can I come, can Kathy respond and then come back to me? If you look like you really want to respond to Kathy. Michelle. Just it was just on the question of CPAC and CDBG, um, in terms of how much is set by legislation and how much flexibility we have. I, so, I don't think we're gonna be able to answer that question sitting here tonight, but we do know that they are both uh state and in fact federal programs for CDBG. Uh and uh okay. those do have restrictions in them. And so the request needs to be balanced against what the restrictions are, which I think is where Andy was going when he suggested that perhaps some of the other recommendations also might be forwarded to the Finance Committee to get greater clarity on that. Okay, if you want to dispense with talking more about it now, we can talk about it in it, finance. We can. I'm, I'm just saying that the, the categories, Michelle referred to the categories, there are categories and within them, right. uh, there are different types of housing, but there's not permissiveness right now to designate something on the base of color or race. So to the extent something specific would come in there, it's higher level legislation. And when you go to CDBG, there are federal guidelines for that and there are categories of things that are ineligible. So it's not completely at the town discretion. What is at the town discretion is relative emphasis each year. And you can see that a lot in CPAC on spend a lot more here or a lot less here. Um, but that can be a separate one. Those were the two I were gonna question on how much flexibility we really have there um, without hire. And Kathy has been the liaison of the CPAC committee for a number of years. And it's just been watching things you thought would fit get tossed aside because they right. just didn't fit. Right. <laughs> Well, and I remember very recently there was that whole effort to, can we include solar? And the reality is that would be a whole new category and would have to go through the state legislature. Um, I, all I'm suggesting is I don't think we're going to resolve all of that detail around that this evening, but 
I think that is part of what we would expand this first motion to include in its referral to finance. Jennifer? Yeah, so initially I did have questions about um, CPAC and the block grant funds, but so I just wanna say, you know, quickly to thank um, the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, you know, really so um, in awe of this very thoroughly researched informative report and also really appreciate that it has such a detailed roadmap. And I, we, a successor committee is absolutely needed. And I think the programmatic areas that you suggest of affordable housing, youth programming and business grants, how could anyone argue with that? So I just, um, I think you've given us a report that we can move forward with hopefully quickly. And I do hope that the finance committee you know, can really look for a way to accelerate, you know, the implementation and, and the funding. You know, I hope that will be possible. And when Rabbi Jacobson was, when you were reading your remarks, I was just shaking my head and I agree with everything you said. So thank you. Pam. Thank you. I will acknowledge um, and appreciate the work that was done, done by the committee. Thank you very much. It's an enormous, enormous task to grapple with. A uh, question I had was, um, has the current assembly uh, actually helped pave the way by for a successor committee by creating a draft charge for that committee so that the this process can roll out? And the second part of the question is, who actually takes on the responsibility to formulate and form up the successor body? Thank you. Because I because I support doing it. Excellent. So thank you, Pam. Um, there is a draft in the appendix um, that I believe would be referred. Page one. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Mandy says page one ten, um, and that is uh, what I would imagine will be referred uh, to the G GOL committee. Um, and then the GOL committee will have the opportunity, um, I think with some feedback, uh, to, to sort of work with that initial draft, uh, before bringing their recommendation back to the town council. Right. Yes. Um, thank you. And thanks to the committee for everything, but for handing us something to start with, it's always a good place to go. Um, uh, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, thank you. And like everyone else, I want to thank the uh, committee, the AHRA, for the work you've done. I also want to count, um, thank all of the people who've done the research behind these reports and the people in the community who have uh, participated in surveys and sharing experience. Um, uh, there are many questions I could ask um, or have been asked that what, what I want to do is make a commitment. I want the council to make a commitment to really implementing a reparations fund. And I think that commitment is there, but I think we need to honestly not put it on a shelf. And I don't think we're going to. The drive is too strong. But the other thing, uh, and this is important, uh, I forget now who suggested that the council participate in the stolen beams, uh, stolen beam um, work. I think we should be making a commitment to do that. Individually and as a full council, we need to address this within ourselves and within our community and our history. And I am asking the council tonight to make a commitment to that. Um, and to commitment and a real commitment to implement the uh, suggestions of this committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dorothy, I'm going to skip to get to Kathy, who really has not had an opportunity to make a comment yet, and then come back to you. Go ahead, Kathy. Thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, I actually wanted to thank you at first. I thought, oh no, I'm rereading some information that we got earlier when we first decided to do a reparation fund, but I think you did it quite artfully, bringing in parts of that so you had a whole report. Um, I found the survey quite interesting, um, and I have one question about the survey. So I just want to re, um, 
focus in a few things that we've been talking about on the funding options. Option two talked about, in a way, it talked about don't think of it as an endowment fund. And actually, I never thought of it as an endowment fund until you suggested it would be one at a meeting, Michelle, because I quickly did the calculation and said that's not going to provide very much in the initial years. So um, that's doable within the framework we've already set is one of the things I wanted to mention to people when it, it goes to finance, because it's within the cannabis award each year, and it would build up a fund more slowly, but it would release money every year. So it's just, a, there is a, at first I thought there wasn't a feasible way of doing this, but there is if we don't think of it as an endowment fund and just live off of its earnings. Um, so you'd come up with a number 100,000. I think that's worth discussing um, on whether it needs to be that every year and priorities. So just on the funding side, then on the what is eligible side, you the report talks about on an individual basis, we're likely to need special legislation. But I think for some of the other subsets, we may need it as well. So I don't know how much you talked about it. For example, um, training people on entrepreneurism. If we restricted it to only subsets of young people by African-American heritage, we would run into a similar issue as opposed to, um, I don't know, a broader, a broader youth category. So it's on some of the others, I think you run into a similar, not exactly the same, so it's not individual. So I, I think it, that needs a little bit more thinking. Um, then my question, one question I've had for a while on the youth center versus pre-K, um, preschool, where I think a healthy start on life, um, especially for lower income working families with kids, giving them a place that their children can thrive. Um, it's not in the report as a potential area to think about. So I don't know whether you discussed it or not, but it was always a place I thought might be worth considering. And again, we would run into something that's just for African-American, but as opposed to saying it's for low income, it's a sliding scale, and a preponderance of that will be people of color. So that's my question on a missing item. And my last is just a request. I would love to be able to get my hands a little bit more on the survey, on the actual data, just in the summary. So if there is a way to get that at some point, it would be great. Thank you. Michelle. Thank you. Yeah, I think the full um, survey data that I received from the Donahue Institute, I don't think I know that it's been included in the appendix. Um, it's, I talked at length with Carrie and with the Donahue Institute about uh, you know, this is an anonymous survey. And so when you start getting into like really specific data, you could uh, inadvertently identify right. people. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I see Lynn who has a lot of background on this shaking her head. So mm -hmm. we can certainly go back to the Donahue Institute and ask, and maybe even you could specifically, if you have something that you'd like to see, but I think there was a purpose for provide I don't have any more detail than what I have uh, provided in the or that what we have provided right. in the appendix yeah. um, so we could we, but we can see if we can get more <laughs> uh, without sort of having okay. that I, issue. I understand the issue and so I'll yeah. think a little bit more on how to tease out a few pieces so that thanks good yeah and then just to a answer a couple of your other questions Kathy um, so your question about, um, for example, the training, um, business training. So one way to think about it, I think you're absolutely right that there's a possibility that with certain benefits, the uh, special legislation will be required. Um, but if you think about, for example, um, having stated goals, right? So you can say that uh, like the folks that are developing Ball Lane, they say essentially that they are working to help folks who have been historically locked out of the housing market 
um, to in order to pursue home ownership opportunities. Um, so they're not specifying a race. They're just saying they have stated goals that sort of encompass. Um, and in that case, I don't think uh, that it would be necessary to have special legislation. Um, so I just, I wanted to kind of differentiate that. And then um, in terms of the 100,000, absolutely something that the finance committee could review with the rest of um, what they what they will be reviewing. We spoke at length about this. This was a number that we felt would on an annual basis allow us to make some meaningful things happen. Um, and I wanted to kind of pick up what you're saying with Anna's question that I didn't answer actually, which was, uh, well, we, when we made this commitment, thought we had the ability on an annual basis to decide whether it fit into the rest of the goals that we have. Um, and I think that still is the case in terms of um, the council will have to approve by some vote any initiatives that we uh, that we pursue. So that that uh, control is still in place there. Uh, Kath, I tried to get them all if I missed something. Um, oh, the question on pre-K. You said, yeah, um, that's not something that we as an assembly uh, discussed. It wasn't something that came up in our consultative process. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's not uh, a fantastic thing to consider. And if, if anyone else wants to add to that, I would turn it over. Um, Akar, you have your hand up as well. So please. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so Dorothy, we're back to you. Um, I just wanted to comment on one aspect that the whole question of uh, eligibility um, where you have to have records is very, very problematic. And one of the things that I thank the committee for is that I just know that they have thoughtfully considered the ins and outs of those issues um, because people of trauma often do not have pedigree charts um, carefully preserved. Uh, I know my husband's family can cannot go back very far at all. I mean, if you've been a subject of a pogrom or a forced relocation or your house has been burnt down, um, you don't have the records. And, you know, so we have to we have to understand that people will have many people who are very eligible will have difficulty providing certain kind of proof. And part of that is culturally based. I mean, we do have an example of a black family with great records. Okay, so I'm not saying that that people don't have them, but who has stacks of genealogies? Okay, it's the dominant caste. People who've had money, stability, whatever, are more apt to have them. And the other thing is, when when a young black man is in a difficult position and is confronted by the police, nobody asks him who his ancestors were. I mean, people who are black are subject to certain prejudices by people who don't know them or may know them or whatever. So you, you, we, we can't really get the kind of precise eligib eligibility that some people might like. So I think the committee really dealt with that very well. And has, that's why the answer is not bureaucratic. So that's my comment. So thank you, committee. Mandy Joe. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I, before I ask my next couple of questions, because they kind of all relate to each other, I, I, I just want to state that I'm trying to, in reading the report, these questions kind of go to what I had originally envisioned is meant by reparations and what I've read in the report and trying to sort of get my head then around what the report is sort of defining as reparations. So that's sort of the the idea of where these questions are coming from. Um, so again, going back to the Black Reparations Project, um, one of the chapters indicated that a program of reparations must both define the range of history subject to reparations and provide closure for grievous injustice. Um, and so one of the things that I didn't see stated um, 
absolutely, I guess, is and, and obviously, I could have missed it, um, was um, how the plan defines the range of history subject to what you're proposing we do, and then also how it would provide closure for the history of discrimination. Um, in, in similar vein, the, the programs that you have proposed, youth programming, affordable housing, business grants, uh, as, as Jennifer said, are, are who, who would argue against them, right? Um, at, but I, I'm trying to understand how they qualify as sort of reparations from a, a, my original understanding of reparations, which is why I'm asking this, um, if eligibility isn't tied to having experienced past harms because of specific town of Amherst policies um, and a funding proposal that appears to be, as you've said, an endowment ongoing, never ending, um, when tied together with the programs that are proposed, it I, I read the report as more like proposing, in some sense, social services programs that should be brought into maybe our operational um, budget. Um, and so I, I guess I, I'm asking how, how do we, how would you respond to those? Cause I'm just trying to get more ideas of, of what's going on here. Um, and um, and then someone else brought up the special act. So I guess the other question I would have is um, how did you, why did you choose the two items that we're gonna be having a motion on now instead of asking us to pursue the special act? I'm gonna answer the special act and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Shabazz um, and, and to Ms. Bridges if, if she would like to, to follow up on your first question. Um, the special act, so in considering sort of the enormity of this and that there is a lot, there's a lot to consider in this report. Um, and in talking to some community members who read the report prior to it being published more broadly, um, it was, the um, overall sense that I got was that we needed as a community an opportunity to sort of uh, digest the report um, and to digest the recommendations and to consider the uh, possible um, uh, consequences is not the word I'm looking for, but of pursuing the special act. Um, and so these two items that we chose in speaking to our council president felt like the most uh, sort of accessible at the moment while we consider um, and digest the rest of the report. Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead? Okay. So um, this is very rich discussion, and I'll try to... Um, be very um, specific and very brief uh, in addressing some things. You know, I am a descendant of Black American free people. I even have on my father's side, I know the exact ancestors that came over in a slave ship in the 1700s and were enslaved in Louisiana. That genealogical work was actually done for me. It's in a book called The Forgotten People by Gary Mills, so uh, who, I, who was a colleague of mine when I was at the University of Alabama. Not everybody has that level of work done. Mm -hmm. And as has been pointed out, for some people, it's very difficult because of a, a lot of things for them to even begin to know, but I do. So when we talk about Black American freed people, I'm one of them, okay? And when we specifically talk about the range of history, Amherst, this town, benefited from the institution, not only as practiced here, which went out by the, by the early 1800s with wealthy Wheeler uh, in the uh, Coles family, family of Cinda Jones's um, uh, ancestors, as she has shown to me, wealthy Wheeler being the last one that was bought and enslaved here in Amherst in the oldest building that's still there, the Sturbridge House on the UMass campus. But it doesn't end there. The harms continued when you have a Amherst College trustee like Israel Trask, has people enslaved in the South, where I'm from, where my ancestors are from, in places like Alabama and Louisiana, 
had people enslaved there that he directly benefited from that wealth, brought that wealth to Amherst and built up this town and built up Amherst College on that same wealth of black people even after slavery was no longer legal in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So the impact is beyond just whether you trace ancestors here in Amherst who were enslaved. It's that you trace to ancestors who were enslaved, period. And that's where my family then can qualify, even though our ancestors weren't enslaved in Amherst. I think we qualify with that historical uh, uh, um, fact that we're talking about here. Let me say as well, we really have to work to just put the race color aspect out of our minds. This isn't affirmative action rename, reparations. When you talk about reparations, you are talking about addressing a specific harm against a specific people. That is what you are working to repair. So you're not working to repair the, the structural racism against a color. You're, so I liken it, and I really believe we need to pursue the special purpose. It's not on the docket for tonight, but I do encourage you to put it in the queue behind proportional ranked choice voting and whatever else you have in the queue. And as I've talked to Rep. Dom and Senator Comerford, you know, the question is raised, well, why just Amherst if it's going to be important for all of Massachusetts? Well, I say let Amherst lead. And then if other municipalities, Northampton, uh, Boston, where, Cambridge, wherever else says, well, we want special purpose too, then we go ahead and do it like CPAC and, uh, and do it on a statewide level. But somebody's got to lead this conversation to declare reparations for Black American freed people a special purpose in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That it is a valid special purpose to do that, not because of race or color, that was an incidental fact of what was done, but because we are trying to address and repair a damage against a specific group of people that continues to affect their lives, the descendants of those people right now, 2023. Finally, I would just so say as well, and it may not be as stated as strongly in the report as we want to make, we ought to have a genealogical project through our Jones Library, through our universities and colleges, where we are helping every resident of this town, Black American freed people descendant in this town that wants to do their genealogical work and find out their ancestry precisely to where they had enslaved ancestors and possibly even precisely where they came over on the boat, on the slave ship that that work ought to be assisted, ought to be funded, ought to be the, all of these companies that do the DNA research, they ought to be donating that. And we ought to, to lead again in Amherst in making that possible that every resident here can get that kind of help that wants it, can get that kind of help to trace directly their ancestry back into that ignoble institute institution of slavery that harmed this country, that harmed their families. So we can get it, but a lot of this, we could only do so much in this round, but we do think these things can continue to be taken up and, and specified and clarified in the in the future work of, uh, that we go on to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was very, very useful. Uh, Irv, you have your hand up. And I assume you yeah. wanted to address this one as yes, well. Yes, uh, we uh, when I hear people talking about, well, we might have to have special purpose legislation to deal with some of the, the three areas that we have outlined: youth uh, and housing, affordable housing, and business grants. I, I think what we're talking about here is weaving a thread into the fabric of that which is already here. We're, we're not talking about setting up something separate or, or equal. We're talking about using money in collaboration with money that's already being spent. And, and that's the overall generalization that has to be there. Money will, will be set aside for reparations. 
reparations has one of its goals or objectives, affordable housing. Well, affordable housing is also uh, a goal and an objective of several other programs within Amherst. Whether than, rather than duplicating those programs, we only want to weave our thread into that fabric of other affordable housing programs and thereby utilize funds in a more efficient and effective way. Amherst has, has done this all the time in other areas. Uh, you, you can't, you know, uh, you, you you don't have to say for for African Americans uh, uh, who have heritage, but you can set you can deal with the population in the same way that we deal with DEI. Those possibilities remain there. It's only the will and creativity of those who are in those programs is it if we get into the uh the weeds of saying well you can't do this because it's specifically specific only to blacks or african americans uh then we uh should uh stop and sell that issue first before we go any further but that will take some time i don't think we need to do that um there are ways in which we can address these issues and address our, the goals and objectives without going through the whole special legislation thing. Yes, that, you know, if, if the town wishes to put special legislation together for that, that's fine. But that's that should not prevent us from going down the road with these issues. And there's enough creativity and smarts in this group and the town council, et cetera, to be able to make this a reality. Thank you. Anika. Thank you. Uh, so I usually do not respond to such comments, but I need to because Mrs. Pam, you just made a very careless comment about um, some of my ancestors. Um, we know our history, not because of caste, but because we are of cultures who are not meant to know our histories and what happens amongst us is oral history. And this is passed down, and it is it is passed down through inheritance, and it is passed down through specific people. And and uh, the work that I have done is to share um, this experience, not to be experimented with. Um, these are people who have, we have no idea of the majority of our history. We are linked to those who experienced genocide in the land that you call your neighborhood today. Um, land that we were banned from living around. Okay, this is who we are. I'm very fortunate that some of us and some of my ancestors lived to be about 106. So I lived in this history and we heard it and it's oral and we have done genealogy. My cousins that have gone back to the 1400s was like Dr. Shabazz just shared, track us of the ships that we came here. There are many stories on those Civil War tablets that Amherst hasn't heard yet. Um, but one thing that I wanted to also uh, lift, which I hadn't done, is I wanted to um, acknowledge Demetrius Shabazz, who this report was um, dedicated to. Um, one of the first ways, my first contact with Paul Balkum and our town manager was through a very, some very persistent uh, emails about the Civil War tablets. Um, and when I first... Um, put out a call, which was on, on Facebook, because this was my grandfather's project. And, I'll, and I also want to add that from his passing in 2004 until my return to Amherst in 2019, there was crickets. Nothing was done to uplift these folks in this history of Amherst. And so the first person to respond to that Facebook call, that alert was Demetrius Shabazz. Okay, and we got together and we formed a Civil War tablet committee in honor of the of the holiday of Juneteenth that was coming up, Paul Balkum had made sure those tablets got out and were on view by that holiday. And I also want to acknowledge, um, you know, uh, Deborah Bridges, who for all transparency is my mother and the sole curator of the Civil War tablet exhibit. 
Okay, so I would really just encourage us all to be supportive, but again, please stop talking and stop speaking for people of color when it is not your place. We need to be supported and uplifted. Please do not encourage these divides that are going on. We are not of caste, we were poor. Thank you. Um, I'm going to divide my comments in two. One is first as an individual and then to try to move uh, and have us think about the motions, okay? Uh, this is a rich conversation that could not have happened without the work of this committee. And I looked at this report, I read this report, and as I read it, I'm going, well, how about this? How about that? And every time I'm engaged in another discussion about this report, like the one we have here tonight, I see it yet differently. And so now I'm going to move to the state, the position of trying to get to the motions. Lynn, to before you do that, may I just add one more comment? Yeah. Is that okay? It may be one and a half. One is I really just quickly want to hold up Mandy Joe's comments. Um, I think that her question of trying to understand what reparations is, mm -hmm. is a living question. And it's a question that we should all be holding in our hearts and our minds. And so mm -hmm. I very much value that you brought that up and that you've asked that question. And um, I think it's, it's clear that there are, uh, there's a whole spectrum so I wanted to say that. I also just wanted to briefly um, thank town manager Bockelman. Um, I think uh, he's been quite quiet over there tonight <laughs> listening. Um, but, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, but mostly because I have been able to come to him in the last two years through this entire process with whether it be a question a request just to get some guidance to hear from him and i feel we've developed a lot of rapport and trust throughout that process um and when town manager bockelman uh came to um the town hall that we had at amherst college where we did the uh screening of the big payback uh with his partner it was really meaningful to me and to the committee and i just wanted to share that so thanks thank you so as michelle mentioned when we first decided it was time to finally bring the report forward and we had a little bit of delay because we were working on school committee appointments. Um, we came up with two motions and I, I certainly think those motions can um, be talked about and maybe amended tonight before we pass them. But the, the real goal was to make a statement that we're not gonna just say, thank you for this report. We're actually going to make motions that do two things. Look at the funding, the goal of which is to get some things going faster than 10 years, okay? The second is to look at how are we going to continue to look at this as a town? And that's the idea of a successor committee. And I will say that as the GOL looks at the successor committee and a charge for a successor committee, what it should be looking at is obvious, the recommendations in the report. So that part of the charge may be to explore further whether or not we should file special legislation. And same way with the finance committee, it's maybe not just look at how can and if we can accelerate, but are there ways in which within existing funding streams, some priorities can be made. So. These are not perfect motions. Show me the perfect motion and I'll be glad to have it. But they are the motions that recognize that tonight we've been given an incredible gift from a group that has worked very hard. And they're the motions that say, we're not gonna let it sit on the shelf. We're gonna move forward. So with that, 
I know, Andy, you wanted to amend, if you will, the first one, which is to refer the half Af African Heritage Reparations Assembly recommendations to operationalize a $2 million reparation endowment fund within four years to the Finance Committee and a report and recommendation to the Town Council by November 20th, 2023. I wondered if we wanted to say something like to refer the African Heritage Reformations Assembly report and recommend recommendations to review the financial rec the financial recommendations, including operationalizing. It's kind of opening up, you know, talking about CDBG and what is possible or not, talking about um the um, 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 CPA, that's the other one I wanted. And is it doable? So is there, is there a way you want to phrase that, Andy, in a way that you think opens it for the Finance Committee to look at more than just what? My thought had been to just say um, part three of the report funding plan. Okay, so. Lynn, I would add to that. So one, two, and three in part three uh, deal with these matters. When we get to four and five, we're talking about private charities and things. So it could be just as simple as saying, um, referring numbers one, two, and three of section three of the report to the finance committee. Andy? Does that work for you? I that that would work. Uh, it, but the one thing I thought about with the uh, question of the grants is uh, that if we if the goal is to also have staff assistance in developing the grants, then there's staff time involved, and uh, whether that uh, is something that we need to also at least put on the table for discussion by the full council. Um, so that's why I kind of left it a little broader, but I'm okay with uh, narrowing it. I leave it up to the group. So let's try the following. To refer the African Heritage Assembly report, specifically section three, and leave it open. To review the financial recommendations with report I can't read when it's moving, but with a report and recommendation to the town council by November 20th, 2023. Does that work? I'm making the motion. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Okay. I'll second. I don't know if uh, to be consistent with the report, it should be Roman, Roman numerals to get the three. Yeah, if you want to, for consistency, that would be good. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the motion's been made and seconded. Now it's time for a discussion of the motion. I'm going to lower my hand. And Irv, you still have your hand up. Okay, then I'm going to go to Mandy Jo. Um, my, my question is about the timeline on this. And November 20th um, is like four <laughs> weeks away, number one. Uh, sounds really quick, um, but I was I was more specifically curious about it. We have had a, ECAC had a report that brought a lot of um, requests for new funding in. Um, other other recommendations have we've heard from Crest maybe some more funding and more staffing for that. We're moving into the point of the year where we're looking at our financial guidelines um, for next budget year. Um, I think we're still waiting on the quarter, the fourth quarter reports to know where our free cash and all is. Um, and so I, I, I want to make sure that the date is late enough that we've got our fourth quarter reports so that finance can consider that while they're talking about these things, but also so that it brings in the financial guidelines that we're going to be potentially bringing to the council, because I think we need to talk about everything in a, a not siloed. Um, so I, 
I don't know whether I, I don't I don't know the the deadlines enough for when the financial guidelines are coming to the council, but I'd kind of like this date maybe to match that one. So the plan it's at present, okay, is on November 10th. It will be a night of finance, finance, and finance. Uh, basically looking at uh, free cash, looking at specific orders related to free cash, and any number of other things that are financial. So this allows, it, it, I'm, I, I have to honestly say, I think November 20th is close to impossible, but at least it allows the, counts, the fin finance committee to have something in sequence that they could then bring back. And it maybe they don't bring it back until December, but it's, and then the guidelines are discussed by finance committee starting with the BCG meeting, budget coordinating group meeting and presentation of the financial indicators. And that is also on November 10th. The, uh, the, the 13th, Lynn. 13th, thank you, 13th, I had the date wrong. But so in other words, we're trying to line things up so that on November 13th, we will have the fourth quarter report. It'll have come to the finance committee. We will also have free cash and various other financial things that we have to look, look at. And then that is the date when we also do the financial indicators. I'm not saying that the timing's perfect. I'm just saying it's the, it's trying to get everything in line. Kathy, you have your hand up. I'm going to let Randy Joe contemplate this for a while. Kathy, my comment was entirely around November 20th on whether it was feasible or not. Um, my understanding is. The tenth is Veterans Day, so we're not meeting that day. Finance is meeting on Fridays these days. So if the council meets on the thirteenth when we're first seeing the budget projections and starting to think about what the guidelines are, the next finance committee move would be that Friday, which is the seventeenth. Um, so it's there there's a it's this this can be completely severed this discussion that we we would need to have for the the financing of it doesn't have to be attached to this year's financing it's it's more conceptual so andy you're the one who knows what's what else is on our agenda we just bumped two things um because they weren't ready yet uh street lights and uh, residential permits so there's only so much that can be done in each meeting so that's the only reason i'm because I mm -hmm. think this deserves more than a quick conversation. We need to think through options and talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I expressed my all. I like the option two, one of, of taking some of the cannabis money each year and thinking about spending it. But even that is, do we start that in 2025? You know, I mean, what, when would that start? Because um, then we would have to have what we're spending it on decided so so lynn it was just a question on the 20th not looking yep. like uh we automatically are going to need an extension <laughs> okay andy you have your hand up yeah my suggestion is that uh the more traditional referrals that we make from the council uh, don't necessarily specify a complete report but they say a report back okay and uh so that modification in language to be more consistent with other referrals might be helpful and uh, because I think it is to address it. Um, I don't really want to get into the weeds of talking about the deadlines, the dates for the uh, finance committee because it's a whole different subject and complicated. But I will go as far as saying that I have been working with Athena and we have developed um, a draft plan for meetings and and figured out how they correlate to council meetings so that uh, in the work that needs to be done in deadlines and uh, 
one of the things that I want to do with the finance committee is have the finance committee have an opportunity to look at that document and uh, discuss it. Um, and the last thing that I guess I'll mention is that we do, and I'm previewing my committee report for later, uh, but uh, we are planning to schedule a meeting for this Friday and uh, the third quarter report and year end report will be presented that, no, they're not. That's for the 27th, I believe. Okay, well, we'll talk, talk about that later. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, uh, Tina, would you put the motion up on the screen again, please? So one of the possibilities is to say with a report back to the town council by November 20th. It may just be a progress report and maybe it'll be some recommendations. Um, um, this might be a point of order, but it, in the review re revisions, we lost who it's getting referred to in that motion. Ah, it's not a point of order. It's a serious clerical issue. Um, thank you. Okay, so this the motion is to refer the Af African Heritage Re Reparations Assembly Report Section 3 to the Finance Committee to review the final recommendations with a report back to the Town Council by November 20, 2023. Uh, Michelle, you have your hand up. Yeah, just quickly. Um, I have really learned to trust the process, um, and I feel really good about this. I will, however, say that um, I have concerns about if this were to go into the next council, um, that it could be challenging for a brand new council. <laughs> um, so if we could just keep that in mind and probably everyone is. I think that's a very good point. Uh, this is not a way of saying, oh, and by the way, finance committee, you don't, don't have to act, okay? Or you don't have to recommend. Okay, the was, motion has been made. I'm was, gonna was say- Was that friendly been... amendment accepted by the seconder? Thank you. Okay, yes. thank you. The motion has been made, it's been amended, it's on your screen. Are there any further comments? Okay, then we're going to move to a vote. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Grease Marsden. Aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. And Shalini Balmil is absent. It is unanimous with one person absent. We're going to move to the second motion, and it's to refer the draft Amherst Black Reparations Committee ABRC charge recommended by the African Heritage Reparations Assembly to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee with a report, I'm going to say back, to the town council by November 20th. Second. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't even ask, but second, thank you. Um, is there any further question here? Mandy Jo. Yeah, um, I, I have a question about one of the wordings in, in the charge right now. And, and Michelle, I know you're on GOL, but I thought I'd get it out there now there's some other things that I'll ask later, but um, it's one of the bullet points says oversee reparations funds. Um, what what can can you describe what was intended by that wording? Just so I know. To be honest, this was sort of the last thing that came together, so <laughs> um, it might not be the best uh, document in the report, um, and I fully expect it will be modified. Uh, but I think what it meant is that it would sort of um, be responsible for whatever initiatives are coming through to be recommend. It would be the body that would then recommend those to the town council 
in yeah. terms of how the funds should be allocated, but I don't think it's the best choice of boards. Yeah, it, I think what you wanted was to recognize that it has to come to the council. Is that correct? Okay. All right, any other questions or comments? Anika? So um, so we can move on. Would we just submit if we had any any questions or suggestions, would we just submit those and by what day to the OL? I, for, I would like to suggest that if counselors have additional questions or recommendations or things they'd like to make sure are discussed, that they submit those to the respective chairs of those committees, both finance and GOL by the end of this week. Okay. Would you like to know what else is on my calendar? <laughs> We're going to talk so, about it. So, Leonard, you're saying end of this, by Friday, we send to GOL if we have any comments. To the, on the chair show. of GOL and to and copy Athena, please. Oh, Pat. Okay. And, and chair of finance. And and could and GOL tell us which date they're most likely to discuss it in case we want to hear the discussion? We can make sure you know that, but I don't think it's been. I'm asking for it now. I would yeah. just, it's a request. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, are there any other questions? Then we're moving to a vote. Anna Devlin got here. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. You didn't hear me? No, I didn't, Dorothy, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, was... Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Uh, Chalini is absent. And Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It is unanimous with one counselor absent. Uh, Michelle? Would you I like know we need to move on. And I thank you for all the time we've spent on this. I just want to point out these posters that are in the back. Um, Pat uh, talked about the stolen beam. These are visual representations of the stolen beam that were created by a community member. And if you have more questions, uh, Devorah and Jeff would be able to answer those for you. So thank you. Okay. Uh, before we take a break, I'm going to ask Michelle to officially adjourn the AHRA. Yes, officially adjourning the AHRA at 9.22 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. We Thank are you. going to take uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break. We will be back well, okay, 12 minutes. We'll be back at 25 minutes of 10. Oh God. Yes. Thank you.
there was this piece on the left. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I literally ran and got it. I didn't get it, and I still don't get it. I said, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us more than five minutes. Um, we need to start reassembling, gang. I think you don't understand. As you return, please turn your videos on so I know you're back. This is hysterical. We're going to be reassembling. Okay, we, we need to reassemble so that we can continue our meeting. Come on. <laughs> She's joining us at home. You need to get home for her kids. Okay. Um, no. Alma Car, you might want to take your screen off. Doctor Bob, your screen is still on. on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, just FYI. <laughs> wow. Commitment. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. I know Anna's here. I know Anika's here. Um. Alicia, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. All right. We're going to continue our next agenda item. Uh, we actually did the um did pass on the consent agenda the next two items. However, I have promised the sponsors that if they wanted to say anything uh, about them, we could. So the first one is bylaw um, 3.48 3 stretch energy code proposed adoption. And we already voted, but Anna, did you have anything you wanted to say? Have I ever turned down that opportunity in my entire life? Okay, so yes, I do. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues for voting to adopt the specialized opt-in building code uh, this evening on consent. In doing so, we are adopting a code which ensures that new buildings in Amherst will be resilient in the face of heat waves, deep freezes, and other major changes to the world in which we live as a result of a changing climate. It does so, as you all know, by requiring more efficient measures in new buildings and significant remodels. 
This code builds on the existing stretch code standards for, standards for energy efficiency, such as higher levels of insulation, high performance windows and doors, and increased air tightness. It is in many ways a sister bylaw to our zero energy bylaw, creating pathways to full electrification. It's been over 10 years since Amherst adopted the energy stretch code. That was laudable at the time, and I'm grateful to those who championed it then. And now in 2023, we can and must bring it further. This is one of many changes that are necessary. I would like to thank Sustainability Director Stephanie Ciccarello and the Energy and Climate Action Committee, specifically Jesse Selman, for bringing this forward and supporting me as the council sponsor. I also want to thank Mandy Johanneke, who, while not a sponsor, supported me in ensuring I was bringing forward something that, could, that was written in a way that fit within our policy and that I didn't accidentally erase all of the sustainability building code measures for several months while we waited to enact this. She caught that, and thank you for doing that. Uh, policy speaks to values, and I thought these were going the opposite order, so I was going to say I already said that, but I'm going to say it for the first time now. Policy speaks to values, and we are moving tonight on another value that we have expressed, which is resiliency and determination and action in the face of climate change. Building codes offer a powerful opportunity in our fight against a changing climate, and ensuring that all the buildings we build are not contributing to that warming climate and will stand in Amherst for decades to come. Climate action work is work of love and care for those who are here, but even more for those who are coming later. I thank the council and our community for readily taking this step and showing that care today. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the proposed bylaw ensuring safe access to legally protected reproductive and gender affirming health care? It's me again. Okay. Uh, tonight, <laughs> the Amherst Town Council has affirmed our, our support for access to safe and legal abortion and gender affirming care. On We have done this tonight, but we've done this before. We have expressed our belief through resolu resolutions and proclamations uh, and watched as each year the landscape of reproductive and gender affirming care was put under threat and that safety that we valued shrank. In that time and since then, many of us have felt helpless and simultaneously grateful that we live in a state which has protected access to this type of care. Sometimes that gratitude can lead to even more feelings of helplessness. Last year, Councillor Mandy Johanneke approached me to see if we might partner on a bylaw which protects those seeking care in Massachusetts. Initially, I was unclear on why, with the state having recently signed in sweeping protections. But as per usual, Mandy's ability to find details which are potentially harmful in policies and write new policy to minimize that harm and support our community came through. This policy, this bylaw means that no town staff will assist outside organizations who may be seeking information on those who are seeking gender affirming or reproductive care in Amherst. It means that organizations who receive funds from our town may not aid those groups who are trying to act against the values we have expressed and hold dear. We have so many individuals in Amherst who travel here, especially for school. The likelihood that we have people who seek this care is known, it's high. We owe it to our community to protect them. And this bylaw goes beyond words and into actions that do that. I'm grateful to Mandy once again for her work on this as a co-sponsor. And I would also like to specifically recognize Councillor Pat DeAngelis who while not named as a sponsor was a champion of this work. I also want to thank Dr. Hutton and other community members for supporting us and holding us accountable to getting this done. There's incredible power in feeling supported in this work by these folks, and I know that Mandy and I are both grateful. Sometimes, and this goes for both of the bylaws that we passed tonight, sometimes it doesn't feel like there are levers that we can pull in the face of injustices that are so huge, like stripping people of their rights to access medical care or like climate change. But being diligent and searching to make sure we have done every single thing that we can do to protect people is part of our job. I'm grateful to the council for helping us pull this particular lever and support this work. I'm grateful to live in Amherst where we turn our values and our care into policies like this. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're going to now go on to uh, the section item, agenda item seven which is presentations and discussions. Uh, this is specific, specifically set aside to discuss um, and 
for the council to ask questions if they would like regarding the community responder for equity, safety, and service crest. Um, Paul, would you like to start with any comments to begin with? Sure. Um, thank you. And I'm sorry I wasn't here when these questions came up last week, uh, as, as I was out of town, obviously. Um, so there's no denying that this is a difficult time for the Crest Department as we go through some transitions in leadership. Um, there is a, everyone who is involved in the Crest Department is 100% committed to the success of the Crest Department. Um, we are, uh, and we're taking time, taking additional steps to make sure that it stays successful. Um, we are taking this opportunity to um, make sure that Crest is here for the long haul. I've been out on the road talking with Crest, about Crest with my colleagues in the municipal management field and International City Management Association, talking about how this is going to be the future for every city and town to have a department like this. So committed to its success, built it from the ground up to ensure that the people who are employed by Crest um, we're going to have the means to be successful. And for that reason, that's why we had the Crest Responders um, automatically be part of the, our union so that the union was aligned with the mission of Crest as well. Um, we, will, we are uh, down in our staffing. Um, we will be recruiting new staff members for Crest. Uh, we will have a change in leadership. We'll be recruiting for a new Crest director as well. So if there are questions from the counselors, I'm happy to ask, answer them. Dorothy, you have your hand up. I, I it's, been, it's a long meeting and I, I don't remember who said it, but is, is it true that Earl Miller has not been presented with whatever the charges are against him and has not been given an opportunity to defend himself? Because if that's true, I'm just beside myself in shock. So obviously I cannot talk about personnel issues in this meeting. We have a, a statement that I've shared with the council on what we have said is going to be our statement. So I can't go further than that, Dorothy. This does not sound like a democratic country. See, it's it's like- I would not make it, I'm sorry. I, 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 the word personnel covers up everything. Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Yeah. I would just not make assumptions is all I would say. Okay. Andy. Yes. I think that it would be helpful if we had a better understanding of what the issues are that cause the um, slowdown in getting some dispatch referrals so that we could actually have uh, the Crest Department working in the uh, active way that we had envisioned. Uh, and because uh, there's been some reference from various people that I've heard that there were issues, but I just don't understand what they were. And the second thing is, did that slowdown in getting referrals out affect the decision of any of our you know, responders who left to leave? Well, I don't think it was a slowdown. I think that we've been going about this with deliberate speed. We were up and running very quickly, as you all recall. You know, Once you funded the program, uh, we hired a director and we started hiring responders. Other communities like Durham, which is the, the community that we've been modeling ourselves on, and I was just with the people who were running that program uh, where I was last time the council met, uh, they had they had spent two years in the planning stage before they started hiring responders. And I think, you know, looking back, we were anxious to get the program up and running. Um, they had already spent some time. The other situation there that was different than ours is that most of their employees are not unionized. We have collective bargaining responsibilities that we have to abide by when we start talking about these things. I'm pleased that we have concluded all of those negotiations successfully. And, you know, we're able to start moving forward on that with our, you may recall that the dispatchers are part of the SAI union as well. And they had great concerns about some of the things that we were moving forward on. 
that's all behind us and um, we're able to start moving forward on this and in moving into the 911 dispatch. You know, we've learned a lot over the years. Um, you know, what was in, originally envisioned is, is one thing when we get into the ground and, you know, dispatch is a very complicated thing. That's why we're in the Kennedy, the Harvard Kennedy Schools um, Government's Performance Lab. And this cohort that we're in is focused strictly on 911 dispatch uh, because it's a complicated thing for a lot of our cities and towns. Some communities get up and running and, and do it very quickly. Um, we are a smaller community with fewer resources than others. Um, and I think, you know, we will get there. There's commitment from our dispatch leadership, from our police leadership, and from our fire leadership to make sure that we move in that direction. It's just we need to do training of our dispatchers. We need to listen to our dispatchers. We have to listen to our responders uh, as well, which is an important piece of what we're doing right now is hearing what their experience has been over the past year. Uh, what we can learn from them. Uh, they have, they all have lots of uh, opinions and thoughts on what we could be doing better. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a little picking up on what Andy um, was, oh, a little picking up on what Andy was asking. So when I was, I think I saw it in, um, uh, maybe in your press release, and I might've first read it in the Gazette, and then I see it in your, in the town manager's report, but where it says community engagement, I think it's page eight, speaking about CRESS, I do get concerned when I see it says, this is some examples of recent and upcoming events include um, annual rolling green pizza party event, CRESS led a children's slime making activity, um, Crocker Farm, you know, pre-K open house. It just, it does sound like camp counselor activities more than community responders. Mm -hmm. So I am concerned about this. And I can, you know, is this part of what led to the resignations? And I realize there, there's a delay in because of the negotiations with the union and the responders and training, but it seems like they're, I mean, how much, this doesn't seem substantive enough, frankly, for the Crest responders. I'm wondering how much of their time is really spent on these kind of activities. Yeah, I don't know if the crest responders object to this. I think they actually uh, enjoy meeting the public and making these informal connections, which is um, part of what they do is to, they start to build relationships within the community, especially in our um, people and in, in our places where, you know, our, our larger apartment complexes, which is where they are trying to make more inroads. Um, I can't comment on why people will are leaving in terms of whether they were feeling not utilized in this way um, or overutilized in this way. Um, but I think that, you know, this is, I think from early on, the press responders have been out in the, on the road, talking with people, meeting, you know, attending events. That's part of their function. They, they try to go to as many of as events as possible. And Jennifer, yeah, I, I think Dorothy's question was, you know, was the Crest director able to see the complaint against him? Is, I mean, can that question be answered? I can't say anything about the um, departure of Mr. Miller other than what I've already said. Jennifer, did you have anything else? Uh, no, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, Mandy Joe. Um, one question that segues from Jennifer, she, it, it's similar to mine, and then one other one that is um, sort of addressing what Dorothy and Jennifer also asked. Um, can you, you know, when we started the CREST program, it was meant to be an alternative safety response program. And then, as Jennifer mentioned, we're reading some of the things they're doing, and it doesn't seem to be alternative safety. Um, the only thing in that report that did strike me as, in some sense, alternative safety is the fact that the library has reported, um, or the dispatchers reported, that there are less 911 and public safety calls to dispatch from the library because of the presence of CRESS. And I think that shows the potential success of CREST, so I was thrilled to see that. So I guess my question is, um, what 
what as you've negotiated with dispatchers and when and when, when as we've gone through this sort of issues we're having with Cress right now, um, what is the future intention on what types of responses and duties Cress responders will have? Um, are we going to transition away from slime events and pizza parties to more of what's going on at the library, say, and, and what sort of percentage is that is? So that's question number one. And question number two is, can you describe what the town's human resources policy is? Um, regarding complaints, and this is a general question, complaints against employees and the ability of those employees that have had complaints made against them to know the allegations that have been made against them and respond to those allegations. So, yeah, I see I see the um, press does get calls for service. They respond to those calls. I can give you a report on what they have done. Um, I, I, they have a chart that shows all the kinds of calls that they've responded to. And I think that might be more informative than these anecdotal things that we put. I mean, these were sort of their highlight things of what they, of the public events that they've done. Um, they spending a lot of time with individuals. I think there are some anecdotal things in there about some of the other things that they have been doing in terms of case, case management things. Um, you know, so I think that Ultimately, they'll be taking more and more calls. The goal is what we, one of the things we've learned over the course of the year is that um, it's best to start with a, a small number of call sets, call types set that they get dispatched. If you start to build trust between dispatchers, crest, crest responders feel comfortable. And, and that they're the, like in Durham, their first metric of on every call is was the, was the responder safe and did they feel safe? And so we want to make sure that that's always the case because this is a, they have no authority to, it's a totally, um, it's a relationship that's totally voluntary, but whoever they're interacting with, if that person doesn't want to interact with them in a different, in a way, they, they walk away. So making sure everyone feels safe when they're going into a situation. Um, and I think, you know, I think some of the things that we have expanded, some of the work that they've done um, in terms of providing transportation, providing more social service -y type things, which I think was a concern with some of the responders. Um, and that's a lesson learned. We're, we're talking to them saying, what was what were calls that we really liked that were really good for us? I think the fire chief has a metric of that they're, they're applying, which is what calls should we be attending? What calls have we been attending? What calls um, do we want to attend? And there's a fourth, I just can't think of it right now, but they have a, a matrix of calls that they're they're talking through. Um, in terms of, um, you know, if there are violations of town policy, the employees told what the, that they, what the, what those policy violations are. Yeah. Mandy, Joe, did you have a follow up question? Uh, Alicia. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I have a few questions and a few comments. I don't know if you want me to just ask them all at one time. Please or go ahead. One by one. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering how many responders are left that have not already submitted a two-week notice? Um, what specifically is holding back Crest from taking actual 911 calls? Because that has been on hurdle court for quite some time. Um, and I think what I was wondering, I think when I asked the last meeting what the strategic plan is for Crest, that I was looking for a more comprehensive, actually detailed plan, not just that we'll be searching for um, another leadership, but like, are we going to be rewriting the job description? Are we going to just re-put out the same job description? Are we going to have a hiring team? How quickly are we looking to hire? Like, I'm looking for real more specifics around that. Like, what is the plan for Crest right now? Because I feel like that's very unclear to me and that we have clearly shied away from what our original plan was. And so we need to be presented with what the new plan is. Um, <clears throat> I'm also wondering how we're ensuring that the CSSJC as their charge as a su the successor committee to the CSWG is supposed to be overseeing CRESS and its operations and how that's actually happening. Cause it's also not clear to me that that is happening. Um, and I think that that's another really important thing to be thinking about when we're sort of re-visualizing how Crest can properly function. Um, and I think it's really 
important to point out that I don't think these this is happening because we moved too quickly. Uh, we actually did spend a great deal of time doing community outreach, doing research and getting recommendations on how to successfully in- implement the CREST program, how we saw it fit for Amherst residents specifically. And while we did look at other communities like Durham um, and like Eugene, Oregon, we did not model our program after any of those. We actually created something specific and unique to Amherst. Um, and the recommendation has not been followed through. And that is why it is not working because we are not giving what was recommended. That was what the community had asked for when we did community outreach. Like that is not what we're presenting them with. And the responders who were hired to be taking 911 calls are still not taking 911 calls and are not uh, functioning as an alternative to the police, which was the entire point of their job. And so regardless of whether or not they enjoy making sign with residents, which I think is great that they enjoyed that and that they had that opportunity, that was not their job. That was not what their job was intended to be. Um, and so I also wonder that if we are going to be recruiting more Crest responders, are we having a new job description for them as well? Or are we, again, going to put out the same job description as before and hire people that are going to be thinking that they're going to be doing something else? I think we need to completely pivot and readdress the situation in terms of how we're going to set ourselves up for success at the same time and not just repeat the same thing over again. Um, And I'm also wondering about the implementation team. I think we saw that there was uh, an expected end time for Pamela's for Pamela being in charge. And so is that like an estimated thing that like we hope to have someone hired by this time? Is there a specific reason for that date? Um, And will the rest of the implementation team still stand at that time? Like, will it still be at that point just the fire chief and the police chief? Or what would be the plan for that? Um, And I also do, again, think that the implementation team is missing pretty significant members, one of them being myself, um, who were involved in the original implementation team and who have not been invited back to even speak with the implementation team. And I think that's highly problematic. Um, I'm not suggesting that the CSWG be brought back onto that, but there is the CSSJC again, that is, that was why that committee was created. And so I would like to see them leaned upon in terms of coming up with solutions for what we're facing right now. I'll, I'll Thank you. Answer. Sorry. I know that was a lot. So yeah. And if I miss <laughs> it, just let me know. And just let me know. Um, okay. Um, so staffing, I put in my report, there are five responders employed. Now we have budgeted eight we had one vacancy during the summer, um, and then we had two vacancy, two retire, uh, resignations recently. Um, so there are five responders. We know we need an even number typically because we work in groups of two. So the implement the uh, interim man- leadership team had intended to wait for the leadership uh, situation to be resolved before they wanted to recruit. They've changed their mind and said they really we have to start high. We have to get the ad out and start hiring people now. So our intention is to. Um, advertise for the responders. The um, in terms of the leadership, the interim leadership team uh, is formed. Um, the goal is to have it be interim. Our intention is to recruit for a new director um, in, immediately, and hope that they we get that we get we can recruit someone in into that job uh, f- before January first. It's it's pretty ambitious. Um, but I think the the idea of um, that January second date is that is you know everybody on that team has another job and they would like to get back to their regular jobs and this is a, intended to be interim. I do appreciate that they all um, stepped up to take on this responsibility. We have a lot of experience on this interim leadership team. You know we looked at leadership and supervisory um, experience, financial management, organizational um, strategy. Uh, legal compliance, grant management, employee development, and they all have from 12 to 35 years of experience um, in that kind of, in those different fields. So it's an experienced management team, but this is not their jobs. So this is to get us through this time frame um, as we went through this um, this this leadership issue. Uh, so the idea is to hire a new press director and we'll be re- recruiting that. If you have people who would like to serve in that position, we'll be recruiting for that. Um, 
In terms of the job descriptions, I have not had the discussion about whether we would be changing the job descriptions. I think the job descriptions that were originally created are still valid, but I have not asked that question specifically. I just know that they wanted to fill the slots. Um, the, um, what am I missing? What, what did I miss? Alicia, was there another question? Yes, sorry, I'm trying to go over in my head what also was answered and not answered. So, um, what is holding back the uh, the 911 calls? Like, uh, yeah. why why is that still in limbo? Yeah, so um, hitting hitting this turbulence has been problematic for that. We have a signed uh, union agreement as of two two weeks ago, I think. So that took away a major barrier. Um, we we're able to move forward in that implementation. Again, there, there, there's going to make, be some um, qualitative decisions at that at the, with the interim interim leadership team as to whether they think that's valuable to do now. We have some commitments. 911 calls are the holy grail. It's what makes the program, and I believe that. And so we have to get that moving, um, and we have some responsibilities in terms of what we've made commitments um, to make that to to make this program valuable for the town. And that's one of the things that are most valuable in, on multiple levels it, um, because it's what the program is designed to do. It's not It's not strictly for calls. They, they are doing other things. Other programs are doing other outreach activities as well in, around the country. But that is the, again, I call it the holy grail because that's the thing that we, our, our responders want to be responding to is what we, we, we built the program to do. So that's a high priority for us. Alicia, was there anything else? Yes, sorry. Two other things. I think mm -hmm. one was the hours of CRESS. Yep. Um, because I I heard when I attended the CSSJC meeting that they changed, and that was something that I was not aware of. Um, and the second thing was, oh my goodness, sorry, I just had it in my head. Maybe answer that question, please, oh, sure. and give me sure. a second to remember what the second thing was. Okay. Yeah, so the hours had been 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, one of the issues that came up when we were starting to meet with responders was the um, the fact that there was a, a second shift that wasn't as functional as the first shift, that all the work seemed to be daytime work. So especially with the reduced number of um, responders, we moved it to an 8 to 4.30 shift. Um, and that was that was the number one request from the responders as we talked to them about what would make them give them better greater job satisfaction at this moment in time. It doesn't mean we won't expand that time frame, but at this point, that's what the hours are. Alicia, was there anything we, else? Yes, and the the last question was about the CSSJC mm -hmm. um, and and using them for what they're supposed to be utilized in terms of the implementation of the Crest program. Um, and why their group isn't being utilized to help oversee this process. So so we move between a sort of a policy level um, responsibility to the operations. The operations are clearly under the town manager. I believe that the, the uh, DEI department who attends every CSSJC meeting, I think they could provide, I think, I'm not sure if Pamela goes to every meeting, but she provides updates to CSSJC. Um, and I'm happy to talk to the chair of, C of, of the CSSJC if that's, you know, determine what level of detail they're looking for. Yeah, I, I would I would highly encourage that, just considering that it is a specific portion of their charge to yep. not just be updated on, but to be literally involved in the decision making in those processes. Um, so I think that they should be utilized because their whole, their li literally their whole purpose is to support the work that is happening there. Um, and just being updated does not give them any way to be able to support or provide input on that work. Um, and I just had one other response to the question you answered before. And my understanding in talking to some of the responders is that the hours were increased from eight to eight without increasing actual responders. So the responders were feeling overworked in terms of in terms of having longer shifts without having more employees working with them. Um, and that possibly less work during the second half of the shift, but that could also be attributed to not even having 911 calls to answer. 
Um, and so I think that it's like a kind of complicated issue that could be looked at and resolved if we're thinking about the original intention of the cre like CRESS and why it was created and how the CSWG recommended that it be rolled out. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to respond to that as well. So I think that's a, it's, a, it's a good point. They, nobody was working longer shifts unless it was they were scheduled at, at their request to work a longer shift. Everybody had the same work day. Um, we did have Saturday um, the hours as well. So some people didn't work on Mondays. They worked on you know, the Tuesday to Saturday schedule. So I should make sure I note, note that. Um, you know, I think the, um, the, the amount of work... Uh, there's some operational issues that came in to, that came to light and during this process that uh, alerted us that they, there had to be some changes that, and things that weren't being done that should have been done and things that were being done that we needed to fix as well in, in talking to our responders. Anna. So I think part of what I keep getting stuck on Paul in, the, in all of this is that, and there's plenty that I keep getting stuck on, but one of the things that I get stuck on is that we, that is that, the crest director, the crest uh, responders are town staff. And so they're very, very clearly under your umbrella. Um, and, and I think I've struggled in this and trying to figure out what is the role of the council in this. Okay. And I think that one of the things that I've realized is that because we as a body have open public meetings and we as a body have liaisons to committees and you are here, that we end up being the group where this kind of thing can come to light. And so I just, I want to name that I don't know if anyone else is kind of sitting here like, well, what, what, what do we do, right? Because of where our limitations very clearly are, we cannot direct you on staffing. Um, and at the same time, this does have implications for the parts of the the town that we do uh, have under our, our kind of arena. So I think I want to say that because if there's something that I'm asking where it's just like very much per our charter, not my place to ask. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me mm -hmm. um, as I'm learning. And so I think some of these are also coming from curiosity uh, mm -hmm. and well, all of them are from curiosity. But so I think to Alicia's point, I'm curious if we've done exit interviews, both for the responders who have left, as well as for the director who's, who's um, left. And what are we learning from those? Not necessarily about individual personnel, but I think I'm a little surprised to hear that we're not shifting the job descriptions at all. Um, and so I think maybe that's because we truly felt, you truly felt it was a personnel issue and not a structure issue. But I think I'd like to hear what we've learned from the folks who have left. Um, and then, you know, I, I think I'm also still hung up on the 911 calls. I think I, I hear that it's a, and I know that you hear the words 911 a lot, but I think, you know, I'm curious also about the impact on on the liability, right? So when we look at on the liability insurance for the town, um, you know, are making sure that those responders are are covered under that and all of that. Um, and was that is that settled? Is that set? Um, and then, you know, I looked at the the job description that I found for the the I think it was the first round of responders. Um, you know, and they I'm really curious how the 911 calls align with that job description, right? So this is very clear responding to requests for assistance for individuals exper individuals experiencing mental or behavioral health, inebriation, homelessness, addiction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm 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 curious how you aligned those two things, the 911 calls and the job and the job duties. Um, and then I had I also had two more. Um, and then the last, I'll I'll say the last one for now is my notes app is closed. Okay. Yeah. I, I do understand the community work to a point. And I think that it, when you think about public health and community health, it makes sense to have the responders out in the community building trust. And that's very clearly part of that job description. And I would love to hear what the metric is for um, balancing that with direct response work. Uh, some of these aren't necessarily related to the transition. And so if you mm -hmm. want to put them up, that that's okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, and, and for some, many of them, the the leadership is, will be much bit more qualified than I am to answer them because they're on the ground with the responders. Um, you're, you're right to sub, recognize the separation between the, the council's goal, the council's role versus the manager's role. As a chief executive officer, that's my role to manage staff and to implement programs. Your job is to evaluate me and to discern, determine my, my employment situation with the town and also uh, for bigger policy. So I appreciate that you, you picked that out. Um, the... Job descriptions, you know, I, I we did not have a 
detailed conversation whether they're going to whether the interim management team is going to um, redo the job description or not. I just had heard they wanted to they they said we need to start to hide we need to get an ad out right that's the message that I had received. Um, I can follow up with them if they're going to review the job description. One of the things, one of the goals was to have the conversation with the interim leadership team with the responders to talk about what are you doing, what's not working. You know, let's, let's, you, they've been doing the job for a year, um, sans the um, 911 calls. The things that are listed in there, the kinds of things that you just read off, those are, those go, come into 911 now, right? They get some direct calls, but a lot of people call 911 with exactly those types of issues. Mental, they may not present as mental health issues, but they truly are. That's why the library is such a free, they, the library has been so frequent, they call directly to Crest. They don't wanna call the police. They prefer to call Crest um, directly. In fact, they've established an office in the um, library, at Jones Library for crest responders to be there so they can on a on a moment's notice can respond to things and it's a it's a pretty constant stream of um interactions that people have and they they liked having building that relationship and both on both sides to build the relationship with the, the library patrons but also um with the staff because the staff were, were hand, we're taking some things off of the staff's plate in this way um the 911 calls, I, I, I hear you on that. And I again, I don't know if I can say anything else other than that it, it is a, again, I call it the holy grail because it's the thing that's going to make this program successful um, is for us to get those 911 calls um, being dis distributed. Um, our leadership, again, our, our dispatch leadership has been on board with this. It's just we had to get over this hump. And we did. And I think, I know, I just want to say we, we've, Cress has been, you know, it got a lot of, um, press and all that kind of stuff early on because uh, we had a very uh, dynamic leader. And, but I, th I think even without that, it's delivering on many different levels. It's not cranking up all it should be, but let's recognize it's, it's a year, it's one year. And so it's gonna take multiple years of commitment by the town to build this department to, into a legitimate department. Every time we look at something, we don't have a model. We're not going to another town and say, hey, give us your model on this because it doesn't exist. There aren't any, there are no other communities in Massachusetts who are doing it the way we are. We chose to put our Crest Department, our Community Responder Department planted in public safety. That was thoughtful and purposeful. It came out of the CSWG and we, we aligned our mission with that. Northampton on the other hand, planted theirs in public health. And they had a fit, they had a couple false starts as well. And, but now they have a new, new system, new director, new leadership, um, it's under a new department. Um, and now they were, they were quicker to the game in hiring their leader before we were. Um, but it took them about a year and a half to, to switch that out. So now they actually, they seem to be doing, I was just talking with Craig stores yesterday about, they seem to be killing it. Like that's not a good word to say. They're really doing really well. And we, we want to learn from them, but their model is different. Their model is a, is a mental, it's is a public health model versus a, a public safety model. And ours, I think, was purposeful to say, we want to have this, we started to not call it alternative um, response, we call it alternative dispatch. And then we're thinking like, why are we saying even alternative? It's just dispatch. This is, is gonna be one of our menu of things that people go through when they make a call, they're gonna say fire, EMS, press, police, and they're gonna choose which is what, you know, animal welfare, whatever, and we have different parking enforcement. They're going to have a whole menu and there's a triage thing that happens when people present, where does it go? And, you know, we have, we, we have a lot of new um, dispatchers. You know, if you read the paper today, dispatchers is really hard to recruit dispatchers right now. You saw, I think Southampton closed down their dispatch operation and asked East Hampton to start handling it. So we're able to recruit new people, but it just, it's constant training, constant training for everybody. It's not a, it's not a stagnant group of people. Uh, we've been really fortunate that we've had a pretty solid group of uh, responders that have st stuck with the program. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, nobody came in saying, I want to be a crest responder. It's not like I, you know, I've just interviewed a whole bunch of firefighters. They Some people, since I was in ninth grade, I went to be a firefighter. Nobody's coming in saying that. They're trying the job out, seeing if it fits with them. Sometimes it does. Sometimes people just want to work for the town. Uh, I talked with one responder who really wants to do my job in another community. But this is his entry point, and he's asking me, "How do I get more experience?" And I said, "Build a new building, a new department. That's an awesome experience, you know. Especially now, if you're going to 
go if the department's going to sink and come out, um, you're going to learn a lot about operations. And um, so I'm hoping that he'll he'll stay committed to the program. But he has other career goals as well. I can't control everybody's sort of personal lives on that. So I think it's you know I'm eternally optimistic. Um, I'm really sad where we are right now, um, and I can't talk about that. But um, other than that, I you know. I believe we have really strong people who are in the leadership role who are every one of them is committed to this to this department and making it successful and um that's my mission as well and um you know i think that there there is no undercurrent for anybody in the in the leadership of in leadership of where we are working who has any interest in seeing the press program fail just the opposite we want it to succeed thank you Nika. Thank you. So I have two questions. One, the first being, um, are there any comments or questions that you're hearing coming from community or this evening from counselors that at this moment you cannot answer but expect to be able to provide more information going forward? Um, and, and second, in regards to 911 calls and with respect to, you know, thinking of the person making the call that um, whomever answers is that person's lifeline from that moment until they get to or uh, where they need to be. Um, are you allowed to share where the responders are within the training process? Like, were they hired in um, with that experience already ready to go? Were they hired to be trained? And if so, are you allowed to share where they are within that process? Sure, those are great questions. So first, you know, we prioritize lived experience as, a, as, a, as an important thing. And that was first a first for our community. And that was something that actually through our HR process, we had to learn a lot about what does that mean? How do people react? Um, and how does our staff react in, in a situation when, when sort of there's a pretty standard thing that you deal with with HR issues that is pretty formulaic. Um, but sometimes situations change. And so like it, maybe it doesn't apply anymore. So we, we are challenging our, our leadership team and our staff who say, well, maybe let's think this through. Does it apply or not? Um, so, um, you know, there's that. I think in terms of what questions didn't you ask? I think I think it's fair to ask. Say, tell us what you've done the last year. You know, I think a report on that. Um, we do have been working on. Our staff is feeling really stressed right now, especially the the leadership uh, level. Um, but I think that had we not had this this situation, I think that that was our expectation was to build a report about what what have we done, where are we going, like that type of thing. That's a totally reasonable thing for you're investing a lot of money into this department. And so I think that's a reasonable thing to do. We are producing reports for our um, state grant. We get about almost $500,000 from the state Department of Public Health every year, which really su supports our program. Um, thank you, Senator Comerford and Rep. Dom for making that happen again. We know that's not there forever. Um, and we're building our budget to be able to accommodate this, just like we are trying to add, build our budget to accommodate the four firefighters and looking at other ways that we can pay for these services that, because we don't have a lot of flex in our budget um, to do these things. So um, in terms of, um, I think that's a, I can check back with them, like what what can, you know, they, they've done some sort of regular things. I can see what they, if they've got something already produced, I can, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, Forget what else? What, what did I miss? I think there's one thing I'm missing. Um, Anika. Oh, so the second part was in regards to uh, the 911 call. Yep. Um, and with uh, just the sensitivity and and the due diligence that yep. we owe to residents uh, making those calls, um, can you share where the crest responders were they hired with that experience already ready to yep. go? Or were they hired in for and to be trained? And then could you share where they are along that sure. training process? So that's a really good question too. And so they were hired uh, in July of last year. They went through the summer, July and August, so pretty intensive training at the Munson Library. Um, 
and then with the intent that there'd be continued training throughout the course of the year. Uh, they were, you know, we, we got them out on the street, moving, you know, addressing things as best they could. Uh, many people came with built-in skill sets, others didn't, others had, had no skills, very, very limited skill sets. And so there was a lot of common training and it's multi, it's not just responding to calls either. It's about, it's, a, it's a lot of, um, uh, learning how to react to different types of people and things like that. So a lot of education on that front. Um, so I think they, um, nobody came in knowing how to respond to a 911 call and that was not the expectation. We didn't say you had to have that experience at all. And, and quite honestly, when we hire a police officer and firefighter, they usually don't have that until they, unless they've got, got prior experience. So it's something they get, they learn along the way. Um, so there was something else though. My brain's dying at this point. It's late. No. Um, I, I think just the last part of it now, my brain is going was where, are you allowed to share where they are oh, yeah. along the, the process, yeah, with so, the training process? Yeah, so it's it's not a sort of, it's not a linear line for how to take, how to respond to that. They're talking about responding to individual situations. One of the things that came up is that I think there were some different visions and some and I think we accommodated responders based on their skill sets. Some people saw their engagement with a case as being a longer term engagement. This is somebody I go, I check on every day. Others saw it as being a respond to the call and, disp and dispense with it, which is sort of more of a police fire kind of response is that, you know, you want to you clear the call as quickly as possible. Whereas Crest was doing both. Sometimes they would respond to a, a complaint by somebody in the town or, or somebody, and they would try and clear it. Other times they had, People had significant, a lot of mental health things, a lot of people with hoarding where they were working very closely with the inspection services, where inspection services was trying to clear the call, but the person actually needed more. But that became a, a friction point for some of the responders. You know, that was that really what their job was? And those are those types of questions were kept coming up. They were providing, you know, one of the high like talking to um, defense attorneys, one of the biggest challenges for a lot of folks um, was transportation. It's the number one thing, you know, getting to court. And they were, if they couldn't get to court, and you know, then they would, then their everything started plummeted down. So, can you help my person, this person, get to court? And it's because they have to go to Belchertown or Palmer or something like that. Um, we started to help people like that. And then the question, we had this conversation, like, well, are we basically Uber? Is that what we're doing? What, wouldn't it be cheaper to buy Uber? And so these are the questions that we're learning from our responders because we were responding in a real way to a need. And then they were like leaving town. Were we really comfortable leaving town? Uh, were, were, were they going to maintain their insurance? Of course they do. Um, so I think all those things we've learned a lot during the course of the year because we were kind of saying yes to lots of things. Help, you know, helping kids get to school. You know, there was a, this, this morning there was a 911 call. I listened to it and a, a mother couldn't get her kid to get on the bus. So they called the police. Like, that's not the person we want to have respond to that but that's the only choice the mother had. And so, and last year the responders were engaged with it, with some families about just sort of being at the bus stop at crucial times because there was conflict at those times and having a, an adult there made it better. But they were clear, this is not a, we're not gonna be here every day forever, but we'll, we'll, we'll inter intervene for the time being and we, can, and we have the ability to do that. Lots of examples of things like that where they have proven successful um, but also just learned from our responders and they, and actually responders had different approaches to things and they, and they started to build like, well, you're the expert in this, you're, you're better at this than I am. And they start working as a team that way a little bit. But again, it's, it's, we're learning, uh, we're adjusting, um, you know, we, we're, we're trying to align with the original vision of, of making it be public safety. We're not doing everything that, that we was envisioned, um, because sometimes the need is popping up in a different way and and people are learning about it. So every department has called Crest at some point um, to say, we could sure use someone here to help us with this situation, um, you know, conservation, DPW, um, recreation. Uh, the schools were big, they were huge. Um, they loved having Crest part of their, helping them out on different things. Michelle? I'm sorry, did that? Okay. Michelle. 
Thank you. Um, Paul, do we have a policy of doing exit interviews for staff or, or having that opportunity available for staff to do an exit interview and, um, you know, with with the hope that you would be able to gain some feedback through that process? Yeah, so I believe HR offers an exit interview to anybody who leaves. And I'm not sure if, you know, for the two sometimes people don't take advantage of that we do and we do a fundamental exit interview did you turn in your keys and that, that type of thing sometimes that's done electronically but the, the the hr department always offers the opportunity to people to give an exit interview and that's a really valuable source of information for us great okay thank you um alicia Um, please let me know if you lose me because I keep getting like unstable internet connection and freezing. Um, but I just have a, a few more comments and questions. And I, I just am honestly not convinced that this program is being built off of the recommendations that came out of the CSWG. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of core principles that were identified by the group that are not being honored. And I wanted to just really quickly touch on liability specifically because it came up a lot and it came up a lot in the implementation team meetings when I was on the implementation team as well. And it was something that was addressed wholly in our report uh, by the LEAP um, consultants. And they have done research and work with other communities to create alternative response models. Um, and so we do have a roadmap and it was written by the CSWG. And um, I think it's a whole lot easier to just follow that roadmap than it is to try to forge a new road while, while we are driving the car. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I am still very, very curious and not sure if I understood a clear answer as to what is the specific thing that is preventing Crest from taking 911 calls. And I know it's a little bit more complicated at this specific minute because we don't even necessarily have the staff and leadership to be responding to those 911 calls. But I, I am curious as to why we didn't have it even before we got to this point of all of these resignations um, we have been in negotiation. It had already been determined a long time ago that we needed to phase in calls. That was something we talked about over a year and a half ago when I was on the implementation team. So I just can't see that that is still the reason why we have not been able to take 911 calls. And I'm wondering, like, what is the specific thing that needs to be addressed in order for that to start happening? And is this program still being seen and utilized as an alternative to the police because that was its very clear intention that was literally the charge of the cswg to figure out what uh services were being currently performed by the pd that could be outsourced it's not in my opinion being talked about as if it's being seen as an alternative to the police and so i'm wondering if that is still how we're looking at it um and i'm also wondering about the demographics of the remaining responders and what we will be doing to ensure that when we are recruiting, we are trying to recruit and retain very diverse staff. Great, great questions. Uh, so the demographics of our team is it's a majority minority leadership team. It's a majority minority um, department of responders as well. So both groups are majority minority right now um, out of the, the four leadership members and the five uh, responders who are, who are there. Um, is it, a, is it an alternative to re to police? I wrote them down this time, so I wouldn't forget them. Um, I think it's a legitimate question. And I think, um, in talking to the previous director, you know, the sense was that the vision, it, you can't overly rely on a single vision because otherwise you lose opportunities. But I think it's a, it's a thing, one of, one of the things that we talk about now is a reset, look back at what we, why we were set up, why were we set up, what did we do, what should we be doing, and what are we, what are we gonna do going forward? And I think that that's why, that's the stage we're in right now. And I think it's to go back to the founding documents is an important piece of that. So I think that that's a, a good thing. The 911 calls, why does it take so long? Um, the labor negotiation contracts that we just signed were expired in on June 30th of 2021. Sometimes labor negotiations go on for a really long time, and um, people for you know for whatever reason um, we don't make progress on them, and until a certain whatever happens happens, and then we reach agreement. So 
in terms of that one piece of it, that's not the sole piece for 911. There are other things uh, we were moving towards, but that was a key key piece of that. And liability, we've I think we've addressed that. that that's not an issue for the town. You know, responding to 911 calls with responders and things like that. It's a concern that people often bring up in terms of liability, in terms of insurance. We will be covered on that. Lucia, was that it? Yes, um, I'm still just ha having a follow-up question about the 911 call. So did we finish negotiations and is there an answer for that now? Or, so are we saying that there is no longer a holdup in taking 911 calls? There's no longer a collective bargaining challenge to that. So now it's just determining what calls are being selected? Or is there another process that we need to go through for that to be able to happen aside from hiring? Yeah, good question. So, so it's about implementation now. And it's about talking with, you know, getting our dispatchers to a point where they feel comfortable and getting the training that they feel they need to be educated about the CREST program. What kind of calls are we sending to CREST when they send something to CREST? You know, we've built a program to receive 911 calls. All the radios are outfitted appropriately. Uh, the responders have, they respond with numbers of their, who they are, as opposed to, which is what the normal way that most people, most of the public safety responds. So it, all the infrastructure that was put in place was aligned with public safety, the report writing, which people don't realize with police report writing is about 50% of their job. When you have an interaction, then you go back and you have to write a report. Um, so they they followed, we purchased the, the um, report writing software that the fire department uses because we had some, um, already had some um, experience with it. We knew there were people in our IT department who were familiar with it. So there's just lots of pieces in play. Um, but I think, you know, and one of the other things that we learned is you start with a handful of call types and you start doing it and you, and you see how they work out. Um, and always be prepared to have some trust that if you need help, you call, you call help. So what your question is, what are the barriers right now? I think it's the uncertainty in the department, um, you know, because once we open the, the, once we turn on the spigot, you can't turn it off. That's one of the things we learned when I talked with Durham. He said, once you start talking, taking 911 calls, you can't stop. It, it, it's not just like, oh, try it for a while and see how it works. You have to be really prepared to start accepting them and responding to them. Dorothy? Um, Follow-up question on the uh, crest at the Jones Library. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to tell if there's any cost savings? I mean, it sounds like you have people there all the time, so that would cost more money. They have an office, more money. But on the other hand, police are not being called there all the time, so maybe you're saving money. Um, mm -hmm. is, is there any any sense of, of how that's working? You know, I don't know if it's a cost savings, uh, Dorothy, ex explicitly. It, I think it's a... It's, we always call it the appropriate response. Most mm -hmm. of the um, thing, most of the calls that the library calls for are uh, behavioral, uh, or you know, somebody sort of doing something that that's uncomfortable to other patrons. Yeah. It really is just someone who can you know talk to the person, walk them outside, have a conversation. It mm -hmm. police sometimes are the the wrong response at that moment in time, um, and so the fact that. Respond. It wasn't like responders were doing nothing else. If they were needed someplace else, they could certainly respond. It was just they were being called to the library a fair amount, and they felt like, you know, we could be over there and just, you know, mm -hmm. we don't have to walk over there every time because we're a lot of our calls are coming. And one of the the anecdotal things was that dispatch said we're getting a lot fewer calls from the library. What's going on with that? And it's I think because we had press presence there which is a, a good thing because that's, again, we look at the appropriate response for the call. Um, so I don't right. think it's a cost savings uh, necessarily because once people are on duty, they're on duty. Right, but I know that some, some arguments for some civilian control besides what you're talking about, the appropriate response is also the misuse of police officers mm -hmm. so that they're not available for something that would actually call for a police person. Right. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions this time? Okay. Um, thank you. And Paul, thank you for um, spending the time to respond and for counselors for your thoughtful questions. 
yeah, and just if, if there are questions that come up afterwards, please call me. I'm happy to talk through them with you and um, if, if that's easier. Great. So now we're going to go back to the resolution in the wake of the Hamas attack on Israel. Uh, Pat, you asked that this be pulled from the agenda, from the consent agenda. Andy, you also asked the same thing. And was there another counselor that asked that it be pulled? I don't see Pat. Oh, there you are. Okay. All right, Pat. Yeah. Um, I, I have. I'm proposing uh, an addition. Um, to what is now the final where um, where therefore whereas therefore be it resolved I'm sorry um, on the final part of this resolution if we could scroll down to that uh, Lynn did you want a motion on the floor to begin I'm sorry did you want to put a motion on the floor to begin this past proposing an amendment and we that don't have a motion on the floor an amendment so can you put it in the form of an amendment? We need a motion on the floor to amend. I'm sorry. Thank you. I move. Do you want me to just do it? Yeah. Is there a second? No. D'Angelo is second. I'm moving it. <laughs> I move to approve the resolution in the wake of Hamas's attack on Israel. And I, Pat, did I hear you say you seconded? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, Pat. Okay. Uh, I want to thank Michelle for bringing this forward, and it certainly moved everyone on GOL, um, and we all became sponsors. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized that in what is now the final, now therefore be it resolved, we talk about um, uh, the Amherstown Council expresses our unequivocal condemnation of Hamas and its appalling acts of terrorism and stand in solidarity with members of the Amherst community, et cetera. I would like to amend this to add following um, uh, and its appalling act of terrorism and say, and also express our condemnation of the indiscriminate attacks by Israeli forces on the Gaza civilian population. And then uh, we, stand in solidarity with members of the Amherst community. What Hamas did was horrendous. I need to ask for a second, Pat, before we go on. I, I seconded the... No. You're looking for a second to Pat's amendment? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Is there a Sorry. second to the amendment? Can we Can see we it up? up? It... Yeah. it she said it so fast that I didn't know oh, I'm sorry it was. <laughs> no, you're good. Do you want me to read it again, Athena? I just need to know where to put it. Uh, right after appalling acts of terrorism and, and instead of, we're in between and and stand. Yeah, right there. I second it, Walker. And, and now it should say population and stand in solidarity. Okay. So the motion's been made. At, I need a second. Uh, Alicia, seconded Alicia seconded it. Alicia second. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further con questions or comments? Jennifer. Can't hear you, Jennifer. No. Jennifer, at this point, we only are dealing with the portion that has been highlighted in yellow. We're only dealing with the amendment. And then we would vote on the And then page. we vote on the whole resolution. Well, Andy has a, uh, a correction right. that he wants we'll deal to make. With that. Well, let's deal with this amendment, proposed amendment first. Jennifer. Okay. okay. Sorry. All right, the, Dorothy, your hands up. So I see we're having some equivalence here. 
with the beheading of babies and killing of kids at a dance party with any kind of uh, military action uh, that has been taking place. Uh, I thought that the attempt was to have a non-political motion that was not going to get involved into the tit for tat and, and relationships, which are very fraught, we all admit, and just comment on the the recent particular incident that just took place. Not the whole history, but just the particular incident that involved in butchery and murder. So uh, I, I, I'd I like to respond. Bringing this into talking about now get the whole Middle East and, and this group and that group, no, that is not no. what this resolution is supposed to be about. And, um, you know, so if, 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 if we're going to have virtue signaling all over the place, I think this is not the place to do it. One of the things oh, that the, Pat, re excuse me, I need to have people raise their hands. Raising my hand. And, fine, Pat, go ahead. If we look at the whereas that says we recognize the complex history, it is a complex history, and I'm not referring to the full history. What Hamas did was horrendous and horrible. And the Israeli attack on Gaza civilians, the uh, bombing of hospitals, the killing of children and women, and and is also going on. And we need to condemn that as well. This is not a tit for tat. It is not you're as bad as I am or you're worse than I am. This is a horrible situation. And one of the things that we need... Pain can drive us apart, and but pain can also bring us together. And I feel like this is a more reasoned response. Both sides at this point are wrong. It doesn't matter who's, who started it. There's, you know, does Israel have the right to starve people by blockading? Do they have the right to kill civilians? No, and Hamas had no right to do what it did in Israel. None. And I don't support it. Jennifer? Yeah, I um, have been con I've concerned since this idea was first brought forth that we would be debating Middle East policy in Amherst Town Council, which I don't actually think is appropriate. Um, so I will probably take my name off as a sponsor. I, I don't know. I just don't see this whole endeavor really getting us to a place anybody's going to really feel good about. So that's, okay. I don't know if I'm formally asking to withdraw the whole resolution, but that's my feeling. Okay. There's a motion on the floor with regard to this amendment. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, we're going to have to come back to the issue of people withdrawing the sponsors after that. Mandy Jo. I'm still thinking about how I'm going to vote on the motion to amend. Um, and possibly thinking about asking for the removal of by Israeli forces because the and goal- Mandy Jo, I can't sorry, hear you. And possibly thinking about the removal of the phrase by Israeli forces, mainly because the goal is to condemn the killing of civilians, um, not to get into the geopolitical. And in an odd way, this, Resolution, I, I thank Michelle, but the resolution has some personal meaning to me, even though it's not related, my personal meaning is not related to Israel or Gaza or anything like that. Many people know I lived in China for six months. Um, part of those six months I was there was in 19, I was there in 1999. And many of you because it was probably just a blip on a radar in 1999. But while I was in China, the US bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And I was living with Chinese students at the time. And there were many 
in Beijing many um, protests against the US and my Chinese roommate, when we asked our Chinese friends about the protests and their thoughts and what they thought of us as Americans, their response was to recognize our humanity and say, that bombing was not you. You don't control your government. That bombing was your government. You're not your government. And I see this resolution and some of what Pat is trying to do with this addition as recognizing that the Gazan residents are not Hamas. Right. And that the Israelis civilians are not the Israeli government um, and trying to stay out of that geopolitical that political um, issue is to the disputes regarding control of territories while recognizing that humans have humanity and they deserve to live their lives and we should recognize that they are bystanders, standards to situations that they have no control over. And that's what I see this resolution as doing. Thank you. The motion's been made and seconded to amend by adding the, the uh, words that are highlighted in yellow. Michelle? Yeah, I just, I wanted to follow up on what Mandy was suggesting. Um, I guess I'm I'm not understanding if we were to remove by Israeli forces. I mean, I guess who else are we talking about? You know, if not Israeli forces. So I guess I I'm just a little I'm curious if Mandy could expand on that because I was kind of feeling something for a moment, but then I lost it. So just trying to get clarity there. if Mandy would be willing to answer yeah, that. It, it was a potential suggestion as to maybe would the phrase that Pat is suggesting to add be less controversial, but still um, convey the same underlying meaning of killing of civilians no matter where in that area of the world they are currently residing is wrong and so I, I thought maybe the removal of that phrase might lessen some of the concern about making this into a political geopolitical statement on the situation and the history of the conflict in that area of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michelle, thank you. Michelle. Yes, no, thank you. Okay, Dorothy. I'm looking at the resolution and I see phrases that are here. Um, they mentioned the innocent civilians in Gaza who are powerless and caught in the crossfire of this horrific violence. I see another statement. We recognize the complex history and ongoing conflict between Israel and Gaza and support equal measure of justice and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians alike. If the concern was for citizens, innocent people caught in the crossfire, that is there. I did not listen to the GOL meeting that put this together, but obviously that was a major concern when they put the words together. So I don't see the need for that additional statement if in fact it is from concern for the civilians because two times they are mentioned here. So I think we need to be clear about what is in this resolution. Uh, when it's on the screen like this, you can't see the whole thing, but what you can see 
support equal measures of justice and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians alike. You can see that. And above there is the statement about innocent civilians uh, of in Gaza. Um, um, so it's it's expressed very clearly the concern for civilians, for people who get caught in the middle of, of wars. So I, I, I do not see the need for this amendment because I believe that the resolution as worded carefully by the GOL has done it. I originally had written in that I wanted my name added to this resolution. As it is written now, I support it, but amended as the proposed amendment, no. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm uncomfortable with the proposed amendment that's on the floor right now because I, um, well, the words of the indiscriminate attacks by Israeli forces, I think puts us into a very different status. If it said, so, if the amendment was something like, express our regrets that the lives and safety of the Gaza civilian population has been affected, or something along those lines, I would feel comfortable with it. But um, I, I don't feel comfortable with what is specifically before us right now. Okay, Anika. I don't know that there's um, an easy solution to this or what these sponsors might come to agreement with. Um, but I know even the resident that, you know, asked for this to be brought forward. I know time um, at that at that point of time was at the forefront. Um, and I think when we just see what has gone on um, between even now and then, what we're all seeing. Um, I, I see the need to, to recognize all who are in this community um, who have who have been impacted by just uh, enormous loss uh, loss of, of life. Um, I do not have any specific uh, recommend recommendation with this, but I'm um, I'm hoping that there can be some agreement which satisfies the the sponsors in in how to move forward with this or not. Thank you. Exercising my privilege as a counselor, rather than add this power, this piece that's in yellow, I would actually prefer to just say the Amherst Town Council stands in solidarity with the Amherst, members of the Amherst community and not get into the debate of who did what and what we should condemn. That's all I have to say. Jennifer. I was really gonna say the same thing because I think the way it words now the way it, it was worded before the amendment, stand in solidarity with members of the Amherst community whose family and friends are directly impacted. That's on that's on wherever you happen to be in that part of the world. So Michelle. Just to give a little clarity for folks who are not in GOL, um, that first uh, line and the now therefore be it resolved was actually uh, originally the second whereas and the idea was it, this started as a proclamation and I think Mandy pointed out rightfully that this is not a celebratory uh, you know measure and so we changed it to a resolution and we moved that language down um, if we are to remove that language then we haven't condemned uh anybody or any organization um and so i just i just want to point that out um and i also wanted to ask pat um because i i i understand i think where pat is coming from and i uh, appreciated the language that andy just suggested and i wondered if it got you pat any if that language was at all uh close something that you could uh you know work with it, it is potentially something i could work with i would like to see it and i'd also like to hear alicia's comment before 
we do any more moving around? Sounds Alicia. great. Thank you. Um, and Pat, Alicia. Yes, thank you, Lynn and Pat. So I, ac I actually was going to say a very similar thing that I I really hear exactly where, where Pat is trying to go with this and I respect and honor and agree with that. Maybe the wording is not exactly where we want it to be, but I, I do understand the intention, I believe. Um, and so I would, I like, I want this to be a resolution that we all feel good about and that we can all pass because I think that's important. Um, and so I don't want to agree to anything that's making any member feel uncomfortable here. Um, I, I would be happy to rehear Andy's suggestion because I also thought that thought that that was a good one, but can't fully remember exactly what he just said. Right. Um, so I would like to rehear that. And I think maybe if we play with the wording a little bit, we can come up with something that honors what Pat is trying to say, but that doesn't go against what Dorothy was also bringing up because I believe Dorothy also had a good point. Right. Pat, did you want to comment? No, I agree with what uh, Alicia just said. So I'd like to see if Andy could come back and share his wording and we can see how we can make it work. Yeah, I'll uh, offer it uh, um, again. I changed one word probably, but um, where you have and express our regrets that the lives and safety of the Gaza civilian population has been endangered. Just a quick, I think it's expresses. Yeah. Our regret, not regrets. Or maybe the first one's supposed to be express, but there's an expresses right above it, and then an yeah. express. They should agree. We gonna express. Oh, yeah. It could go to express in both places. Uh, Michelle, you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I it shouldn't be up. The, it's ex, town council is acting singular. Danger. It's singular, so it should be expresses. And can't we just not have expresses again, but just say, that's right. Oh, that's an, and regret. Right, regrets. Town council, expresses expresses, town council regrets. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and our regret. That's a noun. It's not a verb. Good. No, take out the R. Yeah, and regrets. Okay. Right. So add an S to the regrets. All right. So it right now it reads the Amherst Town Council expresses our unequivocal condemnation of Hamas and its appalling acts of terrorism and regret that the lives and safety of the Gaza civilian population has been endangered. It and should be have been endangered. The lives and safety have been endangered. Have been endangered. Right and stands in solidarity. Because the regret oh. has to have an S at the end. Yeah, and regrets that the lives. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Jennifer, you have your hand up. Thank you, Anna, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, regrets isn't sitting well with me. And I think I don't do my best writing at 11, so I apologize. I'm gonna try to- Yeah, you're right. I'm gonna hear what I'm saying here. It, it sounds like we were involved in this and we regret that. And I, that's not true. So I'm wondering if there's a different word other than regrets um, that gets at that same sentiment that we are upset, devastated, all of those things, right? And so I think if there's, I, if anybody has a wonderful, amazing word. Raise a hand, please. Raise a hand, please. Um, Michelle. No, I, I'm still thinking on that, Anna, um, but I did want to suggest that we, I mean, it seems like a bit of a run on here. I'm just wondering, do we ever have two now, therefore, be it resolved? It seems yes. it, it should say, resolved. be it further resolved, the Amherst can't, 
town council stands in solidarity with the members of the Amherst community that, you know, should be a separate um, just to, and I'm still thinking about that. I, 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 I do understand what Anna's is pointing out there with that word. Uh, there needs to be a I don't know, what do we semicolon after the words endangered. Yeah. So distressed is another one. We haven't heard yet from Pam Rooney or Mandy. I'm sorry. Uh Pam Rooney. Uh, how about we, uh, in the first one, the, the town council expresses their unequivocal condemnation of Hamas and its appalling act of terrorism and sorrow that the lives and safety of the Gaza okay. civilian population have been endangered. So it's another... So it gets rid of the word regrets. It's our, it's our condemnation and sorrow. Oh, sorrow. Good, good. Yeah, good. Um, I heard somebody say good. Michelle, you have your hand up? I do not. I, I'm on my phone and I apologize. I'm not getting this right. I do not. Okay. Uh, this has been amended and amended and amended. So, Pat, you made the original motion to amend. Do you accept the changes? Yes. And who seconded that motion? Alicia, do you accept the changes? Yes, I do. All right. The motion to amend has been made and seconded. We will now vote on the motion to amend. Um, no, just it's the motion to amend. But if we're trying to do this more efficiently, I think Andy had one That's more one, thing yeah. that oh. maybe we could put into this one before we vote right. on the motion to amend. Right. Andy, you had another one you wanted to put in. Thank you. After Andy, it should be Kathy and then Jennifer. Yeah, I see that. Sorry. So in the um, fourth whereas clause, which is whereas we recognize the complex history and ongoing conflict between Israel and Gaza, I think it should say Israel and Hamas. Yeah. I second that. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Kathy, you've not spoken. because I'm so tired, I might not speak clearly. Um, but uh, um, when these resolutions says, be it resolved that we, comma, the Amherst Town Council, I think it should be a comma, we stand in solidarity. The council can stand, we as a plural. So see up above, it's we fear, we, and it should be we express, not we expresses. So. Do you, do you see my, it's just purely, yeah. so there should be yeah, a yeah. comma after council. That's so right. we express, and then next, we, the town council, comma, stand. I'm just it purely. Stand, it, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Kathy? No. <laughs> Jennifer. Thank you for expressing so, yourself. So I just have a question. Maybe this is not the time. It's when we vote on the whole resolution, but there's two community sponsors, and they should be able to see this. So how does that, you know, we can't, that is true. And there's no way we're going to contact them at 11 o'clock at night. So do they no, have you the can wake them up. after? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So do they would have the option after if they're not, yes, to remove their name? I think we should agree to that. Okay. Kathy, you still have your hand up. Dorothy? I just want to applaud Kathy for catching that the subject of the verb was not town council, but it was we. And I think that was really amazing at this hour of the night. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take all the compliments we can get. Uh, would you please go to the top? Actually, I don't shouldn't deal with sponsors now, but there's various people on here who are listed as sponsors. Is there anybody that wants their name removed or their name added? All right, 
I, I would ask to have my name added, except I'm afraid that it gets too long. So. No, Do that's it. fine. Put, put put Andy's name in. All right. Anything else? All right. The we're going to vote on the motion to amend. And then we'll go back and vote on the actual resolution. Okay. All right. Motion to amend. Um, Let's start with you, Lynn. Uh, it's an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Is absent. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous with one counselor absent. Now we go back to the original resolution. And in this case, we would say to adopt the resolution supporting an act established. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I think maybe that didn't get changed. <laughs> um, we didn't quite get the motions out. To but, adopt the resolution in the wake in of the, the wake of attack, attack, on attack on Israel as amended. Is there that is a motion? Is there a second? There was already. I already a made a motion. That's right. It's already. Thank you. All right. Are we ready? Yes. All right. Uh, we'll start with Mandy Jo. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Uh, Anika, yes, aye. Michelle? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Leisha Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous. And we will ask the community sponsors. We'll be, between Michelle and I, we'll be in touch with them tomorrow. I. I was in touch with Peter Blood and she was in touch with the rabbi. Okay, uh, we are now going to uh, go to, we already did appointments. Uh, we're going to go to committee and liaison reports. CRC? I'm not reporting anything tonight. Got it. Elementary <laughs> school building committee, Kathy? On Friday, uh, Two days ago, we reviewed and accepted the design development report with the new cost estimates. And the good news is with some very nimble work by our terrific design team um, with a few other changes, we're slightly under the cost estimates that were we approved in January, which means we're within budget, which is very good news. And that just so everyone knows, we had to, because of the change in energy code at the state level, we had to go to triple glazed windows. We had to go to more insulation. So we had, and none of that was in January. So then we had to find, and they were pretty creative. They didn't hurt the building at all. Um, and we did a couple other changes. So they, we have a team that is thinking in terms of there is a budget and stay under it if we can. Great. So that's the good news. Finance Committee, Andy. Yes. Um, so this is a non-report in the sense that we had originally intended to have a meeting on Friday, but uh, I'm going to have to reevaluate that with Tina tomorrow. Uh, we're getting behind, and we've identified a number of issues that need to be um, discussed, including um, it. Uh, the referral was to, just made from HRA, of course, uh, the streetlight policy, but we postpone, we're probably needing to postpone that because uh, we'll let the TSO committee report take care of the reason. Um, the rental registration fees needs to come back. The fourth quarter and year end budget reports, all of these things are sort of sitting out there and need to move forward. Um, but we're not sure 
of whether we're going to have um, enough staff support and enough attendance at the meeting to um, on this Friday. If not, we definitely will be meeting on the 27th and taking up as much of the agenda as possible. GOL? Pat? Not at this time. Thank you. Jones Library Building Committee, Anika. Paul is going to take this one. Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's an update on the report in the town manager report on where we are in the Jones Library. Great, thank you. TSO, Anika. All right. No, he's, I'm going to take this one. Yeah, so TSO is going to come ready and prepared for our next meeting. Everyone is going to read the street like policy in detail. Um, we're going to do this out of respect for the sponsors and our residents and our carryover report. So um, we have very we have just a few meetings left, fewer if you count the fact that we have our carryover report uh, to attend to. But to our, our last meeting, um, we attempted with high hopes to get through the streetlights proposal, um, but we had some information coming in late. So we're continuing to be in contact with TAC and Tracy Zafian as the sponsors have been throughout. Um, and we were able to um, at least get some clarity and additional information, including RFI around the waste hauler bylaw. So um, we'll be moving on uh, with both of these agenda items on our next meeting. Thank you. Uh, are there any liaison reports? Pat. Very, very quickly, the Disability Access Advisory Committee is still very interested in becoming a commission and being able to um, be funded and take on different projects. Um, and I have not been able to, we haven't got very far because of the election. So I'm working with them on um, presenting that, but we'll be bringing it after November 8th. Okay, Dorothy? Um, at um, CSSJC, um, they've been reviewing the Crest Leap Report and have decided to host two community forums, one virtually on November 29th and one in person December 2nd. That's it. And uh, we need to just make sure that we get the details on that so that we can have them as part of our agenda. Pat, you still have your hand up? Sorry. Not a problem. Uh, town manager's report. Paul? Yeah, I just want to note, that you haven't mentioned it yet, that the, the election is November 7th, which I think some of you know. Last day to register to vote is Friday, October 27th at 5 p.m. Last day to apply for a mail-in ballot is Tuesday, October 31 at 5 p.m. Um, and deadline to return the mail-in ballot is is on election day at 8 p.m. to town hall. So those are important dates for people who are looking to find ways to vote. Are there any other, are there any questions of the town manager? Um, under president's report, let me just mention, this is the week that we initiate the town manager's evaluation. Um, I've done some recordings. I'm working with um, Angela Mills, which is just delightful. And we hope to get everything launched possibly as early as tomorrow. And uh, the other thing is that um, I did I received a request from the Human Resources, Human Rights Commission, excuse me, uh, to meet with them. And I will be doing that on Wednesday, October 18th. Uh, they've already expressed a desire to have a council liaison. However, this is an item that will have to come before the next council after they are sworn in on January 2nd. Mandy Jo, you have a question. Um, yeah, I just actually have a request. We have a number of meetings coming up that I think you're thinking might not start at the usual 630, that they might start at other times. Can you send us a list of the start times for the upcoming meetings so we can get those in our calendar? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any other requests? Athena, you had your hand on the button. 
the, the next two meetings, the times are on the agenda for tonight. But we'll make sure that you get them. Okay. Are there any other comments, counselor comments? Alicia. Is this the topics not anticipated within 48 hours portion? Yes. <clears throat> um, I'm just wondering what happened to the counselor compensation proposal that went to the finance committee and never came back to the council. And if we have passed the deadline now on that, since it did not come back within the timeline that I thought we were trying to make a decision before the election, which is clearly now not going to happen. And so I'm wondering why that happened and what is going on. It's coming, it will come before the council on the 8th. I mean, I'm sorry, on the 13th of November, along with all the other financial recommendations. Okay, and it's not too late at that point? No, it is not okay. too late. It, 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 the thought was that it should come forward when we know what free cash there is, and all of that is... The goal is that that will all coalesce on November 13th. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, then the meeting is adjourned at 1118. Thank you.